We know why John's the information officer now, don't we? We, we do, we do. <laughs> so <clears throat> thanks everybody for joining. A lot of new faces, which is great. Um, what I want to cover today, I mean, we talked a while back and, and there was a, quite an interest amongst the, the group to look at um, plastic model construction. And um, I, I've done a lot over the years um, in terms of um, plastic models, uh, predominantly um, scale aircraft because um, I used to enter into, into model making competitions and the like. So, but the skills are all transferable to, uh, to what we're doing with our, with our model railways. Um, so we'll, we'll do quite a bit on, on model making this morning. We'll go through some of the tools I use and the techniques. Um, it's really important to recognize that just because this is the way I do it, it's not the only way to do it. So um, it's not at all prescriptive. Um, you, you just look at what we're doing and if you like it, try it. And, but if you have another technique that you prefer, then, then stick with that. So um, what, I will, what I will cover in a bit is uh, a while back, we did a, a scale scenes group build and uh, John from um, scale scenes has, um, has selected the winner of the group build and, um, and I'll be announcing that um, in due course. So um, yeah, I don't want to disappoint anybody, but the winner isn't currently online. <laughs> <laughs> so away, you know? can work out whether or not you've been successful on that basis. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'm hoping that he's going to join us in a bit. And uh, I did ask John to join us from Scale Scenes, as I think a number of you um, know, and he's absolutely snowed at the minute. And uh, so he will, he will uh, join us at some point when he gets a chance. Um, quick update on, um, on what I've been doing on the Scale Scenes side of the house is uh, you'll, you'll know if you've been following Scale Scenes that, um, that John has launched um, a uh, arch retaining wall kit and, uh, and I've, I've started a, a laser cut kit of that, um, which I'll be launching this week. And that's the first test build that I've done of it. And um, it goes together quite nicely. I think it's very clever the way he's done it. And these, these bits here um, are actually arched. You can see they, they're kind of curved inwards. Um, I'm not overly happy with the way the top pieces are fitting in. So I'm just gonna have a look at that and see whether that's me uh, making a small mistake or, or whether or not um, it, it needs tweaking. So uh, that, that should be up um, on the website this week. My plan is to do packs of these because that's that sort of one set that you get from if you just did one print from John for the centre part of the section. And then there's a left hand and a right hand ramp section. So I'm just going to do uh, sets of these and, and, uh, and then ramp sections and then you can pick which ones you want. Uh, pick and mix effectively uh, and I'll do multi-packs of this because as you can see they're not very long so um, but it's, it, it's really robust it goes together lovely so I like the way he's done it. Does, it, so, does it, the kit include the um, the brick surface so you can have recessed but filled in arches rather than them being open? Oh yeah yeah, yeah. I, I deliberate I didn't put the textures on this Pete because you know the textures are the ones of your choice but um, mm. yes yeah, so so yes it's all bricked in inside and um, there's um, in the arch bits here, there's there's two. He's he's done two options. You can do the ones just with brick on. They're all, they're all weathered and everything like they normally are. And then he's got one with all graffiti and everything on it. So for anybody that wants to do modern image with graffiti, then uh, yeah. So so that'll be up this week. Um, yeah. So there's all the shameless plugs. Shall we talk about um, talk about model making? Just before I do, has anybody got any questions following the se session that we did on airbrushing? Yes, Chris, I do. Ah, Alistair, how you doing? Hello, I'm all right. Um, I've not managed to download your video yet. Right. I'm totally lost. You did, did you do a bit about varnishing items afterwards? Not, not specifically. I did, I did put a, a coat of varnish uh, down, but I used, um, if you remember, I used um, that um, floor polish. Oh, God, yes. I, yes, I do know. Yes, yeah. it's... <laughs> yeah, so so there's um, for those that weren't present, there's um, let me just go and grab it and I'll show you. So let me just uh, so let me just round here in the cupboard. I'll just go and grab it. Uh, so it's only one door in the cupboard. Does that mean I've not put it back since um, since I showed you last time? Very tidy, me. Oh. Well, where I put it? 
put it. I'll fish it out during the break, Alistair, and uh, and we can talk about it then. But yeah, it's um, it's a Johnson Johnson's clear floor polish, which is actually an acrylic varnish. So um, so I use I use that. So um, very difficult to get hold of. It is difficult to get hold of, particularly the um, the there's so many different recipes of it. Um, and the one I've got has got the wooden circle with the wooden floor on it, um, with, or did have. I think somebody's been into my workshop and purloined it. <laughs> so I'll fish it out during the break and then, then I can just talk you through that and then we'll go online and see if we can find any. Is that all right, Alistair? You muted, mate. Still muted. Chris, for my planning, what time are you planning to do the break? Um, probably about 10 o'clock, Pete. The yeah, ideal. Yeah. yeah. Dave, Dave's still fast asleep downstairs. I'll probably have to get him up about then. So. Yeah, no worries, Pete. No worries at all. Right then, so let's talk about uh, model making. Let me just bring up a different camera view. Um, That's the wrong camera. That's that's the back. That's what I can see. That's <laughs> that's my workshop. Um, how do I select switch camera? Here we go. Not that one. There we go. I'm just going to take the keyboard off my computer because it's interfering with my. There we go. Give me a bit more workspace. Um, okay, everybody see that all right? Yep. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay, so I thought what we'd do, we'll start by going through a few uh, tools um, that, that are really useful to have when you're model making. Um, your trusty scalpel or knife, whatever you fancy. Uh, I quite like this particular handle because it's, it's a bit bigger than the tiny little um, metal um, um, what's the name of them? Swan Morton handles. Um, this is Swan Morton, but it's just a big plastic one. Number 11 blade I use. Um, Sanders. Lots of, lots Could you just elaborate on choice of blade there? You just quickly said you use a number 11 blade, and I don't think mine is. What are the pros and cons? Of the yeah, I mean, well, I'm not really sure, Pete, to be honest. Um, I, I like this blade because it comes to a very, very fine point. Um, but you know, I'm not a big fan of the curved blades. I um, don't particularly get on very well with those. I just kind of fell into using these number 11 blades. Um, so uh, there's, there's no reason why that I can think of why I chose that. It's just, it just works okay for me. I, I use the 10 A's. I think I can get, but they're a bit cheaper than the 11s because they're not quite so pointed at the end. Yeah, right. 10 A's what I've got as well. Just yeah. Like, you can get a hundred for about seven quid. Yeah, yeah, probably not much in it, Pete, to be honest. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I used to, yeah, I used to use the 10 A's that found that the points break a lot easier than the 11s. Right, okay. Okay, so maybe they're a bit more robust than Gary. Yeah. So, sanders, these are really useful, and you can get them in all shapes and sizes. Um, the, these particular ones, um, these have all come from Flory Models. Uh, I can put a, a link... Uh, on the, I'll create a topic on the forum for us for um, for plastic kit building, and then I'll I'll post some links to Phil's site at Flory Models. Um, the, all shapes and sizes, all types of um, of um, grading on them. So uh, these are really useful. They call these skinny sticks, the little tiny um, tiny sanders. Again, all in different gradings. Um, similar kind of skinny stick here, but this one's made of sponge. So um, very handy if you if you're sanding a, a curved surface because you know if you go at it with this you're going to get flats on it, um, and then there's a bigger sponge version there, um, a really big piece of sponge. These are useful as well, sort of desktop um, sanders if you just want to hold a piece and rub it. Double sided, so different grades on each side. Um, they're very easy to clean as well, so they when they clog up, which they invariably do. You just wipe them on your jeans. So I'd suggest you don't wear your best jeans when you when you're model making. Um, but once you'll see when I start sanding stuff and they start getting sort of clogged, 
and you just wipe them on some on the cotton material like denim and and they come clean then you get these kind of things and these are the, you could call them sanders but they, they're more of a polishing stick it's very very smooth um you can't you can't feel any abrasive on these and um with these kind of things you can use them they're it's quite spongy and uh, I, I would use something like this if i was polishing um a clear part so if you've got a um a, a window with a scratch in it or something like that then you can sand the scratch out and you, you go uh, lower and lower and lower with the grades and then ultimately you finish off with, with a polishing stick like this and uh, you can you can completely eradicate um the scratches unless it's really really bad and, and beyond recovery but um very very common with model aircraft because the um the canopies have a seam in the top so um a lot of them do um so so i would sand the seam out and it course kind of goes all foggy then once you've sanded it out because you've scratched it and you just use lower and lower and lower grits until eventually you get to the polishing stick and, uh, and the canopy comes out absolutely crystal clear. So it um, takes time and a bit of patience. So they're really useful and uh, slight variation on the theme. Um, you'll see these kind of things um, advertised and it's just a little frame that's got a, a piece of abrasive that, that sits in between the two. Um, yeah, I, I read a, watched a review on it and I th it was very positive. Uh, actually in use, they're okay. Um, but I, if if I had a choice, if I could manage with one of my one of my sanding sticks, um, then then I would, and I would only sort of go to something like this if um, it was a particularly awkward piece. This this is quite useful if you're trying to get in a narrow slot and sand something out. So, and you can get all different uh, grades of uh, abrasive that, that fit on that little frame thing. Loads of people do them. Um, I've got quite a collection of, of sanders, but and. Um, yeah, they're pretty much of a muchness, but the flurry ones are, flurry ones are pretty good. Um, if, you, if you have a look on the makeup department, the places like Poundland do a, a four-sided block with relatively yeah. smoother polishing things, and uh, yeah. a packet or two of those are really useful. Absolutely, yeah, that's another another good source for, uh, yeah, from the nail bar type people, they they use a lot of these things. Um, flurry have also launched these this range of. Um, of sanding stroke polishing sticks. And, and he uses these for, for weathering. So when you're trying to scuff off the surface of something, and um, I've never really used it in anger yet, but I'll probably use it on this kit build uh, just to see what effect we get. So on one side, you've got a very light abrasive and on the other side, you've got a polishing stick. So we'll have a play around with that when we get to the, excuse me, the weathering stage. So there's all your sanders, um, very, very useful. Uh, indeed, Let's just pop those back in my drawer. So, what else have we got? So, we look at some pieces here that are useful. So, when you're taking, when you get your kit, it comes on a plastic sprue, and uh, and you need to remove it from the sprue. You can use a knife, um, but it, it's it's a little bit harder and there's danger of damaging the part. Uh, I use uh, these particular cutters, uh, side cutters. They're Citadel ones that come from Games Workshop. And um, I, I don't know if this Games Workshop's still on the go. It's certainly closed down in Chesterfield. Um, but they, they're very, very, very sharp. And they, they, uh, they remove um, the parts from the sprue very accurately without doing too much damage. You can... Uh, use these kind of things this is um i think this is uh who's made this one doesn't say but you um zuron do sprue cutters as well so and and if you want you can use um a little pair of scissors like these these are fiskers uh, scissors so very very good very sharp um it really is down to personal choice what you want to use um but what you definitely don't want to be doing is breaking the part off yeah like, like I used to do as a kid, oh, I need part 45, <laughs> just, you just snap it off the sprue. Uh, you don't want to be doing that, and that's not going to leave you in a good place. Um, so that's cutters. It's just from cutters. Yeah. Is there any, I mean, I tend to use the, the trusty old Zuron track cutters for everything. Is there anything different about those cutters? Yeah. What's yeah, what, what they have, it's the way, they, the way they, they cut. So some of them are shearing cutters, and I think the track cutters are shearing cutters. 
Yeah. Where, whereas these, um, if I can just put them near the camera for you, you that you'll see that they're completely flush on the back. So yeah, the zero ones are the same. Oh, oh, are they? Okay. If they're not shearing cutters, then you'll get a very you'll get a very neat cut. Yeah. yeah? Um, I mean, yeah, it, it, it doesn't really matter because what, what you're not going to do is you're not going to cut the part off right next to the part. Yeah, you're going to leave a little bit on because you, then, then you've got some room for manoeuvre when it comes to sort of cleaning the part up before you use it. If you go right in and cut it right up to the part and then, and then it, it, it basically um, damages the part, you'll see if it's, if it's a dark sprue, when you, when you cut it with your cutters, even if they're really sharp, you'll see it go white. So it almost starts to damage the side of the part. So I always cut it just a little bit away and just leave myself a little bit to play, to play with so I can clean it up without damaging the part. Yeah? So if they, I if they were- I just to make sure I wasn't missing something by, um, by not buying, spending more money on a simple let, one. Let me, go buy, let me well. get my track cutters, let me have a look. Yeah, you have a look. Um, Pete, just while you're, while uh, Trish is away, yeah. one of the problems with calling them Xeron cutters is that actually they make a whole. I, I realise that. Yeah, I mean these are the ones that everybody uses for track cutting, though. That's, that's yeah. So yeah. I think you'll find that if you put the blades together, yes, the shearing up from the track cutters do. There are others. So I've got a pair here. They are not. They are still Xeron, but they. What do you are, mean by a shearing exa action exactly? The the edge of the the tight piece of the the cutting piece of the blade doesn't actually meet the cutting piece of the other blade. It goes past it. No, I don't, no, it doesn't. Not it, on these, it, it doesn't, meets John. It. There's yeah. no, oh, okay. you know what you mean. There's no shearing action on that. Okay. Yeah, so this this is an example of a pair of shearing cutters. These are Zuron as well. So you can see that, that one blade goes behind the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's not yeah. like that. Yeah, so the, things like this are great for cutting photo etch. Um, and they're actually photo etch shears, those. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, yes, if you're happy with that, Pete, you know, all we want to do is we want to get the piece off the sprue, right? right. That's what we want to do. And we so, want to so get- So Chris, you said, I missed what you said when you first got those. They are, they are pretty much equivalent to the-, to the um, Yeah, they are, they're bigger, yes. They're not, they're not quite, so probably not quite so precise, but yeah. if, it, if it gets the part off the sprue okay. without damaging it, yeah, it, it really doesn't matter to be honest. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, it's it's not as long as it, you use them correctly, it's not going to affect the finished article. Yeah, if you go at it like a bull at a gate, it might do. Thanks. But you, you can do that with anything, can't you? <laughs> so, um, hey, if, if 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 your Zuron cutters are the same as mine, I actually bought mine as sprue cutters, as opposed to track cutters. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. They got uh, both, when I bought them off the store, yeah. they got all two or three different sets types of Zuron cutters. Yeah, and one, the one I bought was actually called a sprue cutter, cutter as yeah, is which mine. is different. The one I've got is is called the track cutter. Yeah, yeah. they are different. It's just confusing because they all call them. They're all called yeah. Zuron. Yes, so. but at the end I, of the day, it's 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 a very sharp and controllable. Um, non-shearing cutter with, with the angle, the same sort of angle that the screw yeah. cutter's got. So just a little bit bigger, I think, is the answer. Yes, and, and I suspect that the blades on the, uh, on the track cutter have been significantly hardened compared to the blades on the sprue cutter, because yeah. I think if I was to go at a, at a piece of track with a sprue cutter, I'm not sure whether it would leave some nasty marks. I'm not going to try it, but... Um, not just yeah. the blades, but perhaps the metal back here, so that the whole thing doesn't bend. Yeah, they're you're... quite robust, aren't they? These yeah, they're yeah. quite solid. But um, you know, you you choose your weapon of choice, <laughs> and, um, and and away you go with it. Uh, it's it's really how you use it as opposed to what it is. I would suggest. <laughs> um, even with the best tools, we can still create a mess. And um, these it, a, lo a lot of models now. Well, for a long time, um, some of them include um, photo etch parts. So um, this is just a pair of photo etch um, bending um, pliers, quite useful if you are doing anything with photo etch, particularly small pieces. You'll need, um, I'd suggest a collection of tweezers, um, which again, whichever you fancy, these are ridiculously uh, pointed, but excellent um, tweezers. So a collection of tweezers can be really handy. 
Uh, what else have we got in here that uh, that are used? Oh yes, you, you couldn't you couldn't do model making without some pegs. Okay, so you need pegs. I, I would suggest that when you go and raid them out of the kitchen or wherever your wife keeps the pegs, take them a few smooth and um, just one or two at a time, and then she won't notice. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I have any experience of that, of course, but I do have quite a collection of pegs and I haven't had any complaints. So, so it clearly works. Um, <laughs> sometimes these little things, just spring clamps, they can be useful. Um, I've got some of these and, and unfortunately, these aren't, um, these aren't available anymore. Um, or they certainly haven't been for a long, long time. Um, I, I bought them from a company that, um, that decided to stop trading and uh, I think the guy was trying to sell the the the, uh, the tooling for them, but he wanted a ridiculous amount of money. So I don't think anybody took on the tooling. But they're really really useful because uh, you know just for holding things together. Um, and there are different versions of this, but that one works particularly well. So I've got a few of those. They're quite handy. Um, some bulldog clips can be useful. Um, yeah. So I think that's probably probably it. Look, just looking around at my my tool collection for now and um, maybe some little files i've got some some little files over here um, but they, they tend to be a little bit aggressive um, so i prefer the sanders but you know if you've got something where you really need to get in tight then as you can see these little needle files um can be quite useful um, and then just let me find my drills i don't know if you've seen these Came across these a few years back, but they're hidden under here. Um, you'll have all seen these kind of things, these uh, these sort of drills. You can, they're all over the place when you go to exhibitions. But I particularly like these. Um, and the reason why I like these is because you can actually use them without, you know, they, they, because they've got a, quite a, a big body on them, you can you can just twist them in your fingers. So if you need to, if you need to put a hole in something, um, then then you know, these are really good. And I, that, you know, the, the three quid, I think, on eBay or something like that. And as you can see, I've got one missing already, and, and a couple of the small ones are uh, the I, blades. I found they're not particularly, they're, they're not, they're very sharp. Yeah. They're not particularly, they don't put up too much abuse. No, you have to so be I've, careful I've with them. I've got a like that with all the ends broken off. Yes, I've. Uh, they're not much good then. Yeah, they, yeah, they do struggle a bit when they snap, John. I've got to, I've, yeah. I've got to agree. Um, but yeah, I've I've broken one of them there. But um, they they are they're okay and they're dirt cheap. So um, yeah, things like that are useful. What's the manufacturer's name, Chris? I don't actually know it's because there's nothing nothing on them. I'll have to have a hunt round. And um, I bought mine at a show. Did yeah, you on, the, on a stand? Yeah. I'll, I'll find them on eBay and I'll I'll drop it in the forum. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just really useful. Okay, so that, that's it, I think, on tools. I'm bound to have missed something. There, there are yeah. loads of tools. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, sorry. Somebody asked something. No, okay. So um, there's other bits and pieces that, that there's probably more specialist for aircraft modeling, things like. Uh, rescribing tools and things like that, uh, and I won't I won't bore anybody with that unless you specifically have an interest in building aircraft kits and would like to know how to rescribe a model. Um, okay, so let's talk about glue then. There's uh, lots of glues available. Um, these are my again my weapons of choice. So we'll start with the probably the most common. Um, you know we don't use polystyrene cement anymore. There is a place for it sometimes where you might want something that's nice and thick and gloopy. I think John said he'd got a tube that he got from when he was a teenager that he was hoping <laughs> to use for this build. I think it'd be a bit lumpy to be honest. But so so my um, glue of choice, it, it's actually a solvent. So it's not sticky, you know, it, it evaporates very, very quickly. It's not sticky. But when you put it on the styrene of the of the model, it actually melts the model. So um, when you bring two parts together and you put the styrene on, it, it welds the two very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my glue of choice. Um, it, uh, it smells fantastic for those of you that like sniffing glue. And, uh, and it comes with a tiny little brush as well um, for application. So um, very, very good. I like that product. 
If you didn't uh, tell us what it was. It's it's Tamiya uh, Extra Thin Cement. Yeah, because I can't read that. I can now read it. Now you're holding it steady. But, yeah. yeah. No, okay. I, I think I worked out what it was, but just for everybody else, you, did, you, you didn't actually tell us what it was. That's all. Okay. Sorry, Pete. Yeah. Keep, keep me honest. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, can you keep an eye on the chat for me? I don't know if there's anything in there. There's um, nothing in there now. Okay, no problem. Do you want um, me to make me co-host as well then? Or? Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, I will in a bit because I've taken my keyboard off. So okay, um, okay. I'll sort it in a bit. Um, so then they, they also do a, a Tamiya Extra Thin Cement, but a quick setting variety. So this is the one I think Pete's got. And, and it does what it says on the tin. It, it just evaporates very, very quickly. Um, and there may be instances where... Um, you know, you, you want to get a bond very quickly and um, yeah, th this, this will do the job. And um, I think the, the feedback that I've, that I've read is that it does bond, but it doesn't bond as well as the, um, as the regular extra thin because it has more open time and therefore melts more of the plastic and you get a better bond. But um, there is a place for this if you need to do something very, very quick. Um, and again, same, bo same bottle, same little brush. Uh, really, really good product, um, and pretty much an anti-spill bottle as well, which I like. Um, they Tamiya also do, um, you know, a more. This is a little bit more like um, like the polystyrene glues that we used to use uh, years and years ago, but it's a thick. So it's a thicker, sorry, a thinner version than um, than than what we used to use years ago. So it's a bit more traditional. And, and there are places where I might use this. So you can see it, it, the, the, the consistency of it is um, a lot thicker than the extra thin. Uh, and this is an adhesive. So this can be handy when you've got something that's, you, you put it together um, with, with extra thin, but the, the seam is a bit weak. And then I would probably paint a little bit of this over the seam um, inside the model just to, to secure it. I don't use that very often. Chris, uh, just to understand that then, so the thin ones dissolve the plastic that they're tapping yeah. and then meld that together. Yeah. Does the one you last said, is that actually... It's a glue. It's a, so it works in a slightly different way then? Yeah, it's just like, it's like an adhesive. So it sticks the two pieces together rather than welds them together. Right. Yeah. So, so if you had a if you had a joint that was not visible, for instance, that yeah. was fragile, yeah. probably that would be better because it would give it some thickness. I would always go with this, whatever I'm gluing together, which is I the can't extra actually read what this is, but this yeah. this is the Tamiya extra thin uh, okay. cement. I mean they call it a cement. Yeah, but, but you not... said I thought you said that you said that didn't have so much adhesive power. No, 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 I said, I didn't say that. I said that oh. if you've got a really tricky joint and um, you, you want to reinforce it, then you could you could reinforce it with some of this. Uh, this yes, blue. that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Is that okay. similar to MetPak, Chris? Pardon? That's similar to MetPak? It is similar to MetPak, yes. Yeah, and Butanone and all the other type. Um, it, it really, John, it, it's, I, I wouldn't use this for doing the first bond. And the reason I wouldn't is because it takes too long to dry. As you'll see, oh, when right, we start okay. using this stuff, you know, it, it's, it's seconds. You put it on and bang, it's done. Um, so, so I tend to use this and I, you can see how much I use it because how full it is. You know, <laughs> it, it, I've barely used it, but it can be useful, particularly when you're building model aircraft and you're bringing the two sides of the fuselage together. Um, if, if you need something that has a little bit of gap filling capability as well, then you could use something like this. Yeah, this this has no gap filling capability at all because it's too thin. So it's or my view. My recommendation is go for a solvent adhesive like like this or like MetPak. Um, they're very much similar. And and I think Deluxe Materials do one as well now, don't they? Um, um, a, a glue. Yeah, plastic magic is what I've got. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so very much a similar kind of thing. So, the, uh, so I think the, the thick one is probably equivalent to that, is it, Chris? Oh, that's the... I don't know. I've not got the plastic magic. Is it really runny, John, oh, the plastic magic? Yeah, you put it on with a brush, yeah. 
But the, uh, right. the one that you've got that's slightly slightly gloopy, is that yeah. one as well? The, the Revel one. Oh, yes, because Revel do do one, don't they? Yeah. It's holding yes, it. very similar yeah. to the Revel one, yeah. I think I've got yeah. the Revel one. Let me just see if I've got it on here. Um, I certainly did have. Probably trying to get a lot more. Yeah, Revel do Revel do one, and it's quite nice actually because it's got a really really fine applicator point yeah. on it. Yeah. So so that that can be that's quite a nice adhesive to use, but it, it's not a solvent. So um, I, I you know since I've discovered these solvents, then that's um, that they they are my uh, weapons of choice. Um, if you if you put in together things like Parkside kits, um, they use ABS for their yeah. Uh, their sole plates and all those bits and pieces that go on the bottom and that stuff is quite difficult to to dissolve so you might find that you need something a little bit more um aggressive to to make that uh, make that work so then there that's adhesive um let's cover um fillers so um loads of fillers on the market um I, this is the first one i bought which is a a pretty traditional humbrol uh, model filler. Um, it's, it's actually, um, I think it's an alcohol-based product. Um, like any filler, the, I mean, it's great because it fills things. Um, but the, the downside is with these kind of fillers is that when they dry, they shrink. They always shrink. So, um, you know, you, you're gonna need, if you, if you are filling anything, you're gonna need more than one application. Um, so that's like a, you know, a, a solvent-based filler. Uh, this particular one um, is a Vallejo plastic putty, and and this is an acrylic-based plastic putty. So what I like about this particular one is if you've got a really fine uh, gap that you need to you need to fill, then um, this is this is um, this you can clean this up with water, right? So. Um, you can, it, it won't work because it will be all bunged up, but um, you can basically um, squeeze a, a little bit of this stuff down the, the gap that you're looking to fill, then take a cotton bud and just dampen it a little bit, wipe it over the top of the, of the, of the bit you're trying to fill and it, and it fills it perfectly. Um, so that, that's quite useful for very small um, seams and the like that you might need to, uh, you might need to fill. And then I was uh, I was watching uh, I think it was a, a review of this stuff. So this is uh, Deluxe Materials Perfect Plastic Putty, and um, so I bought some. And uh, as you can probably see, I've never actually opened it. So um, yeah, it's yet to be, yet to be tried. Um, but, but the most important thing to remember with, with these fillers is that they shrink. And uh, so. If you if you fill fill your gap and everything and think great that's all done spray over it if you've not left it 24 48 hours it will shrink back and then you'll be able to see it under the paint so just bear that in mind um, I'm just going to go and grab another filler just bear with me one I forgot to, uh, to put on the wall. <coughs> so you may or may not have seen these kind of things. <coughs> And this is when you're getting into sort of uh, extreme filling where you're trying to get things really, really smooth. And these are, these are like just a thick paint that you apply. They're, they're made by Mr. Hobby. Um, and like all of their range, everything's called Mr. So these are Mr. Surfacer. Um, and um, they come in different grades. So that's a thousand grade and that's 500. So it's obviously thicker. And if you're trying to take out a uh, an imperfection, then you can simply paint this stuff. Uh, and I will be using this uh, probably on this model. So um, you can paint this stuff on, it, it settles beautifully flat and, uh, and then you can just polish polish it up. So um, yeah, that's a paintbrush applied. You can actually airbrush this stuff on as well if you if you so desire. You can thin it right down and use it as a, as a primer and you get a perfectly, perfectly smooth surface. So that's nearly all fillers. There was just one other thing that I want to cover, which is here. So this is in a Tamiya um, extra thin bottle. But what it is, is it's styrene that I've chopped up and put into uh, extra thin um, glue. 
uh, extra thin cement. So effectively, get get like um, people sometimes cut up bits of sprue and use that, but I used um, some Metcalf uh, ten thou not Metcalf um, slaters ten thou plastic yard, chopped it all into little bits, and then added it to um, a um, a jar, half full jar of extra thin glue. What you end up with is you end up with a this kind of like gloop. Um, let's see if I can get around it so you can see it. Um, and the beauty of this stuff, you can paint it on, it's quite thick. And the beauty of this stuff is um, it doesn't shrink. So you paint it on, leave it to dry and then sand it back. And it effectively just, it just fills the, it fills the holes uh, very, very neatly. I might, in fact, I've, I've got a, a piece over here that I can show you. I'll just go grab it. So it's not a very railway model modeler, but it, it will um, at least you get to see where I've applied it. And this is an, an horrendous kit, and I would recommend nobody to, to try and build one. Um, but you can see on here where I've applied um, where I've, I've applied the filler, and then if I just grab a, a sander, um, and you can you can just sand it like it's like it's um, like it's part of the model. And uh, and it sands down perfectly, goes rock rock hard like like solid plastic, um, but um, but it fills perfectly, and as I say, it doesn't shrink. So it takes a bit of time to sand it off, but uh, with a bit of patience, eventually that all of that area that's filled there will uh, will be perfectly flat. Yeah, so you make that yourself, and um, just get some styrene and. Um, Yes, plastic out or something like that. Chuck it in a bottle of glue, and then jobs are done. Any questions? Yeah, Chris, I've got a couple of questions, if I may. Go for it. Um, could you use sprue off cuts to make that stuff? That you yeah, could? yeah, you could. And I was slightly confused because um, earlier on you said the Tamir Extra Thin is is a solvent, and the and they also do one called a glue cement. And then yeah. you said you made your you made your gloopy stuff by putting it in the glue cement was the words you used. So is that the one you need to buy to make that stuff? No, no, you put it in the extra thin. Sorry, the extra thin, not the glue. Okay. Yeah, the solvent. Yeah, solvent. yeah. So because it just dissolves. Buying an extra an extra bottle of that just for that purpose. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you're going to do if you're going to do quite a bit of plastic modelling, then it, I mean it'll last forever. I mean yeah. I've had that about four or five years. If it starts to thicken up, then. Um, you just stick some more solvent in it. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's great. And the other, the, do we need any filler? I missed the need to buy any fillers or anything for this build. Do we need any fillers for this build? Because I don't you, think I've you, got anything. You shouldn't do. Um, and and if if we do, as we as we work through it, then um, we'll try and come up with a way of uh, of resolving it without you having to rush out and buy a tube of filler. I have got uh, some dash modelling clay. Would that do? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, suggest that you do that. use clay. It will it will probably just fall off after it dries. So um, I might have something somewhere. I'll have a search. Yeah, you know this this kit that we're going to build, uh, which we'll come on to in a minute, um, is is a really really basic kit. And the challenge um, around building this will not be will not be sort of filler and the like. Where where you get into to filler um, is is predominantly uh, certainly in model aircraft making is where you bring the two halves of the fuselage together and uh, dependent on how well they're molded you know you want you want a perfect seam um, because if you think if you do it that the probably the hardest to do is an airliner because airliners are all nice and shiny and uh, and smooth and, uh, and so when you bring the two halves of the model together and um, you don't want to be able to see that seam and um, what what you can do with the with the solvent, and, and you'll see this, is as you bring the model together and you squeeze the parts together, the, the glue actually oozes out of the, where the plastic's um, melting and you get like a little lip. And then when you sand that lip off, you can't see the seam. So um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, so I don't think we'll need a lot of filler. Okay, just a couple of points on chat, Chris. Yeah. Um, uh, Alistair's very kindly put two links to eBay for those drills. Oh, uh, thanks, one Alistair. is for drills that you can buy by 
size and the other is for a variety pack of set different sizes. Um, and then um, Nigel has asked, what adhesive do you re would you recommend for the Parkside kits? Uh, I would use Tamir Extra Thin, the, the green one. Um, I've used Mech Pack for those as well. Um, is Mech Pack and that different? I always thought Mech Pack was a different chemical structure. I, I mean, I don't know what the chemical composition of them is, but the um, way they work is the same. They're both solvents. So um, what you'll find is that there's a number of manufacturers make these solvent adhesives. So um, you've got Tamiya, you've got Deluxe Materials, you've got Mr. Hobby um, and, and others, Mech Pack, yeah. Um, but they're, they're all solvents, so they just melt the material that you're, that you're putting together. If you use something that's too aggressive, then you end up with no parts, um, you know, or completely deformed. Um, um, but if you don't use something that's aggressive enough, it won't stick. So um, I, I would start with something like the Tamiya Extra Thin, because I don't think you can go far wrong with it. If, if the, um, the sole plates and all the bits underneath that are made of ABS don't want to comply, then um, you probably want to go for something a little bit more aggressive, um, like, uh, uh, I think I've used Mech, I think, on, on those before. Um, that seems to work okay. And if you really wanted to go crazy, you could go with buten butanone, um, which is very, very aggressive. Um, one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about adhesives was I didn't mention our favorite cyanoacrylate uh, super glue. Um, and, and there is a place for it in, in model making. Um, the, one of the biggest challenges with cyanoacrylate is it fogs. So if it gets anywhere near any clear uh, material, then you're going to get fogging and, and what that means is basically it gives off a vapor which when it lands on sort of clear plastic it makes it go white and um, so so by all means use super glue it's great for for putting small parts on um but just be aware that it fogs so so you, you know if it's in it near any windows or anything like that it's going to ruin the windows um, Chris, that's what, what do you use when you've gone non-plastic parts and if you've got little metal etches or ladders and stuff on plastic kits yeah i mean i mean super glue is good for for um for putting uh, things like um photo etch on um it, it's it's not very forgiving because it, it, it bonds pretty quickly but yes you can use it for photo etch um i wouldn't um i rarely sort of use um super glue to to glue pieces of photo etch together if it's, if it's not printed photo etch, then I would personally solder it, um, no matter how small it is. Um, and then, yeah, fit it with super glue. Another, another adhesive that you can use in model making is, um, is PVA. And so you can use PVA to stick um, photo etch on. And you have to be careful where you do this, but if you were doing an aircraft cockpit and you've got a photo etch instrument panel, then you can paint the the PVA on the plastic that sits behind the photo etch and, and that will be sufficient to hold it on. Um, also, there's things like, uh, have you got them? Oh, is it in me? Or is it in the other room? No, it's here, there we go. Is this stuff, uh, this is my sort of go-to um, um, adhesive for fixing clear parts. So it's a bit like deluxe materials glue and glaze. And um, so again, if you were sticking windows in or you, you were sticking canopies on, um, you can even use this stuff to actually make windows. So you can um, get it on a cocktail stick and run it round a, a, a hole and it will actually form a window and it dries perfectly clear. So glue and glaze, this kind of stuff. Um, one thing worth mentioning about, um, about super glue is that it's extremely brittle. So, so in the um, in the scale model aircraft kind of scene, um, where you where you're putting weapon loads on the bottom of aircraft, you often put you often fix them on with a tiny little touch of super glue, and because if you knock them, they just snap straight off, um, and it doesn't damage the part. The glue just gives up straight away. So uh, a lot of modelers use it in that regard because it's so brittle. Because um, if you if you use a solvent weld and you bang the, the weapons underneath, it's gonna, it's gonna break the model and, and probably break all the weapons as well. So worth remembering that super glue is okay, but it's very, very brittle. 
So that's adhesives, fillers. I think that's I think that's it in terms of of the tools and, and bits and pieces we might need. Um, and then of course we need a model. <laughs> so um, I suppose we ought to start with something. So in this instance, um, I've decided that uh, I'm going to build um, a Nightwing um, fuel depot. So it's uh, it's a PM116 diesel fuel oil depot. Uh, I've never built a Nightwing kit before, so um, I don't know what to expect. So we'll uh, we'll be learning together. So you get a bag of bits. And a, an instruction leaflet. So as all good modelers do, read the instructions, John. <laughs> um, I have, I have. Yeah, yeah. Familiarize yourself with, with what we're doing here. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we might end up with some seams, actually. I didn't I've already glued the tank upside down, but that's fine. <laughs> <Have you? laughs> so, yeah, fair, fairly straightforward um, instructions. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, let's take a look at the, at the parts. So, um, it's all injection molded. Um, this looks pretty clean. And um, you can get something that is called flash. I don't know if you've come across this. I can show you some because there's some here. Um, when when they when they make these things, the, the tooling is actually two metal uh, plates that they that jo join together, and then the the molten styrene is injected into the into the tooling um, under pressure and and it's hot, um, and and then when it dries, it cools down and dries. They they pull it apart and you get this. So where the tooling isn't particularly perfect or where it's a little bit worn, the, 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 the styrene seeps between the plates where it shouldn't. And you might be able to see here, if I just zoom you in, you might be able to see if I just work out how to do this. Just here, you can see these like little bits of thin plastic. I'm still seeing your face, Chris, at the moment. Oh, you're not? Can anybody see my hands? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. Yeah. I can. yeah, yeah. So why am I seeing your face and not your hand? Uh, probably need to change the speak of you, perhaps. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll sort that. You carry on, Chris. You got it. Okay. Yeah. So, so you can see where the the styrene, the molten styrene, is leaked through, and you get this flash. Now, it doesn't matter there because it's on the sprue, but it's when you get it on parts that it starts causing a problem. So you can see here on this particular part, which looks like it might be the handrail, the top of the handrail's got a little bit of uh, a little bit of, um, uh, of flash on it. So we have to deal with that. We have to we have to clean that off. So um, one of the first things I look at when I'm building a kit is what the quality of the molding is like. Um, what what you'll also see is these little circles. On your on your kit, and they pop up all over the place, and they're they're caused by something called an ejector pin. So in the tooling, there's there's pins in the tooling so that when they pull the halves apart, and um, if the model is if the sprue is stuck, the pins pop up and push it out of the mold. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to get it out. And um, I mean, they do put a releasing agent on it, but but the ejector pins are there to actually get the thing out the out of the mold. Um, and they can be a problem because it leaves a mark um, on the on the kit, as you can see here. Um, they, they're quite pronounced; these little circles. And um, depending on how clever the manufacturer has been, um, you know, if they can hide them in a way that isn't going to affect the finished article. Um, when you look at older kits, you'll find ejector pins right where you don't want them. So we have to deal with those; uh, otherwise, you will see them on the finished model. And um, yeah, you, you don't want ejector pins all over your model. Well, you know, if you want it to look any good. So a bit of flash on this kit. And um, something else to be aware of as well is as the, let me just zoom you out of it. Oop, wrong way, sorry. When, as, the, as the plates come together, they need to be perfectly aligned 
and, and if they're slightly out of alignment in, in in that kind of sense you you don't kind if you if you're molding something that's circular you don't kind of get a circle you get two half moons and um, because of the 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 molds aren't aligned and you'll see that a little bit on this kit and um, i have to put my glasses on to see it i might not be able to to show you it um it's not too bad but it's, you normally see it on tubes, you know, sort of uh, things like this, these little little pipes and things where the two halves of the mold aren't perfectly aligned. Um, and, and I'll show you how we go about tidying that up as well. Um, here's an example of a load of flash on here. You see this part? Uh, Got out of focus, yeah. Yeah, this part here, this looks like some kind of railing. And as you can see, it's got it's got flash all the way along it okay so it's um, the same on that yeah, yeah. And, and it's normally a sign that the tooling is quite old and the older the tooling you know the more the more shots they've done with it the more the more you get um that that kind of effect these all look quite nice these pieces um they uh, they've got ejector pin marks in the middle but that doesn't matter we won't see those one thing I did notice, these parts here, uh, let me just get you in the right place. These parts here are actually the stands that the tanks are going to sit on. And the stands are full of ejector pins. There's, there's eight ejector pin marks in the stands. So they're on one side, but they're not on the other. So there's, there's two things we can do there. We can, depending on where the model's going to sit on the layout, we can build the model so that you can't see the ejector pins because they're just not visible from the viewing area. So you can <laughs> face them the wrong way. Or if it's totally unavoidable, then we'll have to deal with the, with the ejector pins. If the tanks are sitting side on to the, to the viewer, then you will be able to see these ejector pins because they're quite, they're quite big. Um, one of the other things that just to note um, on this model is that the packaging isn't particularly great. Um, when you, and um, when you buy sort of more modern Eddard um, and um, Hasegawi and, and even Airfix, Airfix and, and Revel to a lesser extent, they, they package them much more carefully than, than this is packaged. So what you would find is every sprue would be in an individual bag. And, and what that does is it stops the model, stops the materials rubbing against each other and scratching. And if I just zoom you in here onto the top of this tank, can you see there how scratched the top of that is? And that's caused by the, the parts just rubbing around um, in the bag. And uh, if we didn't do something about that as part of our construction, when we come to spray that, it will stand out like a sore thumb. So that, that will be a great opportunity for us to polish that out. As I was saying earlier, using one of the polishing sticks or some, some very, very light sanding. But uh, it'd be likely, yeah. Chris, that the real thing would be pretty battered anyway. I think it would, yes. Um, I think if, if, if you think about when it would be delivered, it would be all nice and shiny and nice and lovely. Um, and then the wear and tear that it would experience would be from them using it. Um, I'm not sure that the end of the cylinder would necessarily be all scratched. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you could look at it and say, yeah, that's, that's just one of those... Um, um, beneficial accidents, if you like. <laughs> um, it, it's horses for courses, but for me, I would polish that out. One other little thing I've just noticed as well, if I can just try and find where my fingers are. There we go. Um, see if you can see. Can you see this piece here? Can you see there's like a Y shape in it? Can you see that? Yeah, yeah mine, mine's the same, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where the. Um, the, um, the styrene hasn't cooled evenly um, and you get sinking. And uh, it's, not, it's not particularly sunk, but I would, again, I would suggest that when I spray that, you might be able to see that. So um, th these are the sort of things you need to look out for. Okay, so that looks all right. Just, just so scratched to health, but, uh, but it will be. So that's what we're gonna build. Um, it's, it's 10 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to go and have a, a breather. And I think you are as well, Peter. I think you're going to go and get David out of his bed. Yeah. So um, we'll, uh, has anybody got any questions before we break for a cup of tea? Just a, a recap, I think, Chris, just to say that I think 
uh, it would be really useful if we had the list of tools you were talking about um, yeah, okay. uh, and any links. I mean, I realise that's quite a bit of work. But you did, you did do a list, didn't you, Chris? You did do yeah. a list before here, so I've got, I've got that list. Yeah, well, I and... sort of was wondering, actually, whether you, we could extend it to sort of a, like a spreadsheet so that we could actually, each of us, if we've got come, come across something that yeah. would be useful, we could add it to the spreadsheet. So like a yeah. separate page on your... on your Yeah, we do it on the forum. Um, and then people could, you know, if they know the links or something, That'd they could link in as well. Yeah, well, really yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, definitely. Good idea. I'll look at how the best way uh, to, to kind of to do that. that yeah. Would be, yeah, but it, it would be useful because you find these little things and, and you see people using them. And you think, well, that looks really good. But you can never bloody find it when you when you want it. So, no, um, right. you know, this. Uh, yeah. OK. Any other questions? Oh, two, two quick questions. Two quick questions. I've got you mentioned packaging and so on. I've noticed that on mine, I don't know if you can see quite a few of these fine detail parts are actually broke. They've got breaks in them. Yeah, but some of mine have as well. Pete. Yeah. That's yeah. something we can deal with as we build it. It's just glue it back we'll, we'll have to, yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, if you look here, um, can you see that one there? Look, that's really bad. It's, yeah, uh, yeah, I've got the same, yeah. Yeah, so that's actually a handrail that's mm. broken. Now that's going to be a pig to sort out. It well, really I'm glad is. you've got it as well, because I can just follow what you do. Oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean... <clears throat> it'd probably be as well, Chris, wouldn't it, to try and attack that while it's still in the sprue potentially john yes yeah now mine isn't aligned in the sprue so and um, the, the challenge with this will be actually getting it aligned but yeah what, what we can probably do is align it up and just drop a bit of extra thin on it yeah and that's an example where i would use the rapid uh the quick setting stuff because i don't want it to hang around for very long mm. Yeah. You know, it's it's going to be tricky that Pete. Uh, and when I, I noticed that the other day that mine had broken, mm, yeah, um, I've got quite a few like that. Have you? Yeah. Again, that's why they package them a lot more diligently now yeah. uh, than they used to. Um, I mean, if if it, if push really came to shove, um, and and we can't we can't restore that, then it would be a case of fabricating a new handrail. Mm, Maybe. A Bit of metal, probably metal, a bit of brass or something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because what you'll also notice is there's uh, the seams on everything. Because you remember I said where the two halves of the of the um, the, the two halves of the uh, plates come together, you get you get potentially get a seam. Yeah. Um, and if you look carefully on some of these rounded pieces, like these pipes and stuff, you'll notice that there's a seam running all the way down them. Yeah. Can you see that? I'll show you. More, I'll show you a close up when when we get to fitting them, and I'll show you how I deal with that because you've got to get that off, and um, because when you paint it, it'll stand out like a sore thumb. So again, uh, we will will tackle how we get rid of the seams on the parts, um, and as we as we're putting the thing together. One other question, Chris. Yeah. When I was doing the old airfix kits as a as a kid. Yeah, intended to paint the detail parts still on the sprue. Is that something you would do? Or? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, there was modelers row about this, <laughs> and uh, you know get very emotional about it. And there was a, a few years back, there was a whole kickoff at, at Flurry Models because Phil had actually sprayed something on the sprue. Um, it, it's you can do it. Um, what you have to remember is that when you remove the item from the sprue where it was connected to the sprue is no longer painted. So you'd have to touch it up, wouldn't you? You'd have to touch it up. So so it's not something that, that I would normally do. Um, I've, I've never, re yeah, that's what we used to do when we were kids. Um, but it, but now um, I rarely find a reason that I would want to do that. I'm just thinking that when it's all attached to the model and you've got different detail bits and different colours, isn't it going to be really difficult to paint once it's on the model? Yes, yes, once it's on the model, yes, and it depends on the subject um, and, and whether or not it needs to be the same colour or something different. But if it was a small part, um, I don't know, like, let's say, like, um, I don't know, like like one of these bicycles that, that, I've, that I've got here. Um, if I was airbrushing that, then I would airbrush it with a pair of spring clamps. I would, I would take it off the, I'm just going to grab a spring clamp, put one here somewhere. There we go. It's actually a heat shunt this, but it does the same kind of thing. So I would I would hold it and, and spray it like that because 
the, the, the bicycle was actually connected to the sprue via its, um, its tires. So I would just hold it on a, a pair of spring clamps and spray it. And, and you can hold very, very small parts with the, with, um, with a spring clamp. I mean, I, I guess if you were, um, if you were building something like a model ship and it has those, I don't know what you call them, things that you put ropes around, like big metal things that they put ropes around. Stanchions, and they, yeah. Yeah. What are they called? Stanchions, I think. Stanchions. Be, is it? Yeah. That, yeah. So normally when, if you're building a model with something like that, what you'll probably find is that it's actually adjoining the sprue where on the bit that actually glues in the hole. So that would be perfect because you can paint it and then you can cut it off and stick it in and you can't tell. So um, there are instances where you do it and there's instances where you wouldn't, um, but, but I, I rarely do it, rarely. But it doesn't mean you don't, you, you can't, you know, if you, if, you, if you feel more comfortable doing that, you know, it's easier to handle for, or whatever. Um, but pretty much every part will need some kind of fettling before you paint it. Um, you know, like I was talking about the seams on everything. Um, yeah, you want to get them right before you paint them. And to do that, you normally have to get them off. Okay. Chris, just before you go, yeah. um, I, I brought this up before, and I think it's to do with uh, uh, everybody uh, has got the microphone on. And I'm getting feedback from somebody. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether it's prudent that we mute everybody apart from yourself. And then yeah. I'm wondering if that's my fault, Gordon, because my laptop has quite a noisy fan. Let me just mute myself and you can tell me if it goes away. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Okay, it's my fault. I'll keep myself muted unless I need to say anything. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Pete. Sorry about that. Yeah, no I, worries. I was say, because of my hearing, I can't do anything other than yeah. put up with it. Now, now you've mentioned it, I can hear it. Yeah. Just, just, just as a wee point, uh, you, if you if you speak whilst you're muted, you get a little reminder that you can use the space bar to unmute yourself while you're speaking and then release it. Yeah. That, that's quite helpful too. Yeah, it is less. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just tried that. It's, it's actually very good. It, Anybody got any questions about what we've talked about so far? Coffee time then. <laughs> I'll, uh, we'll reconvene at, um, shall we say 20 past, something like that? Reconvene at 20 past? Yeah, that's good. Is that all right with everybody? No problem. Yeah, I'm, if, if I'm still working with David, I'll have the laptop by me. I'll just leave it muted and the video off, but I'll still be ear wigging, so. No worries, Pete. Um, and I'll, I'll pause the recording. Thanks. See you all in a few minutes. I hadn't. Uh, got prepared and got one of these uh, diesel fuel depot kits. I didn't know that's what you was. Uh, All right, okay. I might have to play catch up and uh, and get one during the week. I think that's a detention, isn't it, Chris? It is a detention, yes, John. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you say you catch up, it'll be me catching up for you. Well, it might be. Yeah. <laughs> right then, <clears throat> let's have a look, quick look and see. John, can you see if everybody's back in the room? Uh, no, uh, yes, Phil just suddenly popped in. Alistair doesn't have his video on, so not sure about Alistair. No, he's probably just out of the room at the minute. He's there, though. but it's not. Yeah, okay. I just, it's just turned 20 past, so I'll just give everybody a minute just to to, uh, to settle and then we'll start. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to go somewhere. We're going to complete this today. This I, I, don't, I don't think we'll complete it today. <laughs> um, it was a but, joke. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, John, didn't you know the session's extended to midnight? Oh, really? <laughs> so have we told Chris that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my hands are really cold, so I don't know how long I'll be able to... Uh, I don't think I'll make it till midnight. So you guys that are, that are building this, uh, where are you up to? Have you have you had a go at gluing anything together yet? No. Wait yeah. for you. Right, OK. I'm following it exactly as you do it. Uh, right, OK. Well, just, just looking at the instructions... Um, uh, 
it looks you know, putting the cylinders together looks looks pretty straightforward. Yes, glue end one to ring two, making the joint as accurate as possible. Then continue adding rings and finally add the end plate. So we'll do that, shall we? Yes, I, uh, yes. I've put it together. I've separated my rings from my screw. Yeah. And I've put it together. And I think for my use, it's going to be far too long. Okay. And so I've decided to sort of reduce it a bit. And I didn't see a reason not to do that. No, absolutely. I think there's, I think it's quite uh, versatile in terms of the kit. So um, yeah, you'd make it to suit the, the space that you're operating in. So let's get some of these off the off the sprue. So I'm going to use my trusty uh, Citadel cutters for this. Let's put my glasses on. Let's see what I'm doing. See what it comes off like. So it's quite a hard styrene. Say so I've not used one of their kits before. There's a little bit of sagging around the uh, around the, the parts, but let me get the parts off, and uh, and then we'll push them together and see what they look like. So you mentioned, Chris, that we don't cut it right dead close. I mean, how close do you go to the? Well, the, the problem with it, Pete, is there's not very much um, gap between the sprue and the part, is there? No. No. So, so I'm, I'm getting as far away from it as I can. Um, but even then, it's cutting it right flush, pretty almost flush. Just to bring you in on this, so you can see. And yeah. Um, yeah, you can you can just see there. I mean, if I sand that, so the the styrene's quite soft. Yeah, so so you can see that's that white mark that's that's almost that's where the uh, if you like the trauma of the cut is affecting the styrene but it's actually very smooth and what what we do is um when we've got this together before we start you know with we're looking at so it's starting to spray it what you can do is you can just um, spray it with some black paint and the black paint will make any imperfections in the in the cylinder stand out so um would yeah, your uh, ultra thin um adhesive when you put that on would that actually soak into the white fracture possibly yeah possibly um you know, you, we just have to get get them off the sprue as best we can. Clean up the the area where we've uh, where it was connected gently. I'm using a, a spongy um, a spongy uh, sander so that it, it it curves as I push it onto the it's very very fine. It's got a, a very fine abrasive on this side, slightly more coarse on that side. And you can see, you can see how it's scratching the the the, uh, the plastic as I, even when I even when I sand it with the uh, with the very fine side. But by the time you put a, a primer coat on that, you won't you won't see those marks. So we'll get them all off, and then we'll then we'll, we'll clean them all up, and then we'll see how they uh, see how well they fit together. Yeah, very difficult to cut these off peak without being actually right up against it. Might end up with a few marks on the on the model when we come to. Well, it one thing that you could consider, Chris, is when you assemble these discs together, if you can get them all in line and then use that as the base at the bottom. Yeah, that's a good good idea. Yeah, the the only challenge is we've got two of them, Gordon. So. We've got uh, a mark on each side. So if, even if you did put one at the bottom, 
you'd have the other one visible. But I'll show you how we'll deal with that when, when the time comes. I think there will be a couple um, where we, we can't clean them up very well. So um, I'll, I'll show you what we'll do with it. Right, I'll leave those other bits on the sprue for now. If anybody's got any questions, just shout them out while we're, we're doing this, because it's uh, not very exciting, is it, watching somebody sand uh, marks on pieces of plastic. Yeah, when, when, you, when you assemble the cylinders, I assume you're going to have all the marks in the same place so that it's easier to clean up later. Yeah, you could do. I mean, it's they're, they're not particularly bad coal so um, I'm not really quite sure yet what the finished article is going to look like I need to um, I've, I've been looking at research photographs um, so that I can uh, you know when it, when it comes to weathering so I can see what it's what it's meant to look like and what I'm not sure about is whether or not on the prototype the um, the cylinder was all one smooth structure, or whether it had weld rings around it. So I need to just have a look at that because that would change the way that I might have a go at dealing with any where the rings are, where the rings join together. But I think there's a little bit up here on this particular piece. There's uh, you can see where it sagged a little bit. So um, we'll see. So I'm not going like a bullet at a gate with this because what I don't want to do is create any hollows. Just get the rough bits off and then uh, we can put it together and see what it looks like. Sorry, Pete, you, your audio is not very good. You've got the boom in front of your mouth. <laughs> I switched to the headset to see if that helps with the feedback noise, but I realised I hadn't got the microphone anywhere near my mouth. Yeah, that was it. It was around the back of your head. Yeah. <laughs> is that, Gordon, is that better now in terms of the noise? Maybe Gordon. Yeah, yeah, I've got a thumbs up. Okay. Yeah, yeah great. Sorry, so, yeah. So, so, I've got different grit slide. levels here. It's yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I won't, I'll leave it muted when I'm not sort of chatting, but hopefully that'll help a bit. Um, so I, th this pack I've got here has got every, it's micro mesh, everything from 1500 to 12,000 grit. Yeah. Um, so should I start going as fine as I can for this because it's quite soft or? Yeah, I mean, it just just experiment, Pete, with it um, and, and see, you know, you, you just want to take off the minimum you need to take off. You know, you don't want to be filing any flats or anything like that on it. Mm. Um, I mean, this this particular piece has sagged so much that, um, you know, there's almost a lip. There's almost a lip on the side of here. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll the, all of those things will start to stand out, I think, when we when we put it together. Yeah, I, I took, took the, I've taken a file to mine, uh, and I know that's not what you're doing, and I understand exactly why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, uh, but in order to just get it just the, near enough, and yeah. then what I had thought is once I've glued it all together, yeah, then I would be able to then concentrate on getting the whole thing. Absolutely, John. Down. Yeah, absolutely. You'll be able to do that. It's it's just uh, preference, really. I like to get it somewhere near. You know, it's not it's not at the level where I would have it if I was spraying, but. Um, I mean, you can't you can't prejudge how a manufacturer decides to do something, but you would sort of think that if it was a single cylinder, i.e., not segmented, 
that he would have moulded it in the other way. So two halves put together. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Because, I mean, I'm guessing that they've done it this way. Well, I don't know. Yeah, we need to put it in the bag pictures. or something. But I would assume yeah. they've done it this way because the prototype they've used is ringed like that. Well, that's what I was saying, Pete. That's yeah. exactly what I was saying. I think maybe mm. it is. There is, there is another. Uh, there is another aspect, and that is you can make uh, you could make several different tanks of different sizes. Oh yeah, well that's right. That's, that's the good. fair point. Yes, yeah. uh, Nightwing tend to look at things that way. I've noticed. Right. Yeah, that's the fair yes, point. Yes, because it is actually very long when you put all the eight segments or whatever it is. Together. Yeah. So yes, that's probably why they've taken that approach. Did anyone notice that um, it's a, it's a diesel fuel tank and the and the yellow plastic cardboard thing comes with it? It's got a picture of two electric locomotives on it. Oh, I spotted that straight away, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think so, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you know me too well, Andy. <laughs> I can still hear that faint screaming in the background. Let me just try it because it may be even maybe this even this microphone's picking it up. Let me. Yeah, it's gone now. Yeah. Right. Is anybody building anything different while we're talking? What are you making, yeah. Gary? I know you're doing something. I can't I'm see doing something different as well. What, what are you doing, Alistair? Um, I'm actually, where is it? Um, I'm short. I just don't mute myself. At the minute, I'm looking up an alternative to the uh, acrylic floor polish. The oh, plate right. one. oh, I was going to get that, wasn't I? Yeah. Uh, d -d 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 Zep, Zep Floor Refinisher is an acrylic floor polish. Is it? Available, right, okay. available at Screwfix, $7.99 a litre. Yeah, I wonder what it's like to use in practice, though. Are you going to be the guinea pig, Gary? Uh, apparently, people are using it for doing acrylic coating on, on circuit boards. All right, OK. Uh, just reading up, it's durable. It's a light blue colour, but dries crystal clear. Right, OK. Uh, 7 99 your local screw fit is worth a shot. That's interesting, Gary, that you've said that, because um, I went hunting on Amazon. And this product here, which seems to be, I presume is similar, seems to have a lot of reviews from people uh, who are railway modellers. Yeah. Right. When you say here, Alistair, I think you mean on the chat, don't you? Yes, I do. Yes, I have. Yes. Yeah, when I've said, yeah. I've, I've posted uh, my uh, efforts in chat. Okay, cool. Right, I'm nearly there with these. Yeah, but kit-wise, I've picked up the yeah, the Nightwing basic. It's just a tank and a refueling pump station. Right, okay. I think I've got It's the... not a whole station, it's just the pump and mount. So, you know, just the cheaper version of what you've got there. Right, okay. Um, Anybody else? Colin, I can't. Um, it, you've got you've posted a JPEG. Um, what is? I can't actually see it uh, without downloading the thing. What? You what is it you're showing us? Just a picture. You just got to click on it and download. You've got to download it. You can't see it in chat. Uh, okay. What? It, what am I bothering to do? You know, is it worth me looking at? No, don't worry about it, John. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much trouble. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Memory's precious. It'll be a bit too small for you anyway. It's N gauge. Oh, right. <laughs> I've already bought the drills, Alistair. Thank you very much. I bought two sets of those. Yeah, no, no worries. I thought, well, since Chris is doing important stuff, I thought since I'm just sat here listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shall I, uh, shall I announce the winner of the group bill? Why you decided? Well, not if it's not one of us. <laughs> I really want to know. You already know it's not you, don't you? So, um, yeah, so um, so I've been in contact with John, and what he did was he I gave him a list of the, everybody's names that uh, 
that 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 was uh, partaking in the competition, as it were, or the group build. And uh, he downloaded a <laughs> random number generator from the internet and used that to to identify the winner. And uh, and the winner will be in receipt of a ten pound scale scenes gift voucher, which uh, is very nice of John to to do that for us. And uh, and so. Shall I do it like they do on the telly, where they go, the winner is, and then pause for about a minute and a half before I announce it? Or no, I, just... I think you should start with the people that haven't won. Well, everybody that didn't win... Yeah, was... but you need to go name by name. All oh, right, do I, John? No, you bloody don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> We've got enough of this sort of crap and pointless. <laughs> um, interestingly, Alistair's link, when I've gone to it, is actually in Amazon. And in the, you know, how they try to buy, get you to buy other stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, that the Pledge Revive, which is the, the main product link, which is gloss, is linked with uh, Microset and Microsoul, and also another product, product called Pledge Clear yeah. multi surface wax. So, not, so clearly, I mean, Microsoul and Microset wouldn't normally be bought by a housewife. So I wouldn't have thought. No, not unless she's really into decaling. Well, that's right. So it sort of rather implies that this is being used by modelers, isn't it? Indeed, it would, yes. I'm just trying to find where I've put mine. It's, uh, it lives in this cupboard over here. But, uh, the only thing is we don't really know whether this is, which of those two products is the better. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, well, one is one is sixteen quid, and the other's eight quid. So it's quite a difference in price. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what I'm about. I've done with that. I've just done clicked on the link in the chat to the pledge. Oh, that's is. that's gloss, not matte, isn't it? Yeah, that'll be gloss. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? No, right. Is there a matte one as well? It's the I one you use, there's... Chris Matt. Is that matte? No, one that gloss. Use? This That's is gloss. Oh, it is gloss. Sorry, my mistake. Okay. Yeah, this is the one I use, and uh, and it's you can tell because it's got this wooden circle of a wooden floor on it. Um, it's un that's unavailable on Amazon when I looked. Well, it's it's unavailable, you say? Yes, uh, but that might just be for uh, us over here. Maybe yeah, I, I can't remember where I got it from. What, what are you using that for, Chris? It's, uh, it's an acrylic varnish. Yeah, what's it called? What's okay. Name? Yeah, so, so what I use it for is um, if, you're, if you're weathering um, or, or you're preparing to decal, it's, it's like the save button on a, on a video game. You just lay down a, a layer of this over what you've done, uh, and then that's a new surface that you can start your next layer of weathering on. Um, but for decaling, I would always put this down uh, before I put any decals on, because and that's and, that, and, that, and that's just this, you know, obviously you can buy uh, model uh, yeah. acrylic varnish uh, in in twenty mil bottles at, at yeah. price. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. So so the beauty of this is you get about a hundred times more for the same price. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but you yeah. do need to be careful because um, some of them. Um, yeah, some of them don't dry as clear. This this one dries really clear. Can you show us what it's what it's called? Show us the label, please. Can you see that? No, no, no I can't. Oh, that's because I'm not sharing your screen. Sorry, take your pardon. Can you hold it up to your camera in front of your laptop? Yeah, that's it. The other way around. Towards your left. What you're looking at my face, John, aren't you? You're not looking yeah. at my. I you... want to look at yeah. Because I've can, got... can anybody see my desktop? Yes, I have. Yep. Yeah, yeah that's because I'm using the other screen. To oh, I see, internet. John. Right. Okay. Right. It's called Pledge. Pledge what? Floor care finisher. With the brown circle on it, John. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. I'll put it back where it belongs this time. Oh yeah. This is this is a this is the one I got originally. And it's not as good, it's kind of milky. That's why I changed it for this one. But yeah, when, when, you, when you're decaling, 
and the, you want the, the flattest or the smoothest surface you can get before you put the decal on it. So you, you put a gloss varnish on, apply the decal and whatever you need to do with it, and then, then finish it off with a matte coat afterwards if it's a matte finish you want. Right. So back to this, this model then. Um, so my first observation is that when you, when you bring the two halves of the part together, there's some play. So you'll need to be very aware of that when you, uh, when you apply the adhesive so that you don't end up with ridges. Does that make sense, John? Yeah. See? Notice the instructions have a really useful, useful bit of advice that says, uh, what does it say? Make the joint as accurate as possible, it says. Yes. So it's really helpful, that. Yes. Now, so when you, as you'll see in a minute, when we apply the solvent, um, you, you, get, you get a bit of wiggle time. So, um, yeah. So what it, it's suggesting is that you start with this end and then you add these on bit by bit. So let's just stack them up and just see exactly how long it actually is. And are we assuming that these seams between these are actually on I'm the prototype and, and, and are desirable to be visible? I'm going to look in a minute, Pete. Yeah. Or, I'm, or I'm going to ask somebody to look for me because it's I'm not going we to need to. We need to find a photo of the prototype, really, don't yeah. we? Yeah, they, they are way. out there. They are yeah. out there. So, uh, yeah, if anybody want, is sitting in, if anybody's sitting in front of a PC, you're all sitting in front of a PC. <laughs> If anybody could uh, just have a look on the web and just see if we can get some pictures. I think my, my preference would be um, to, to make that smooth. But, uh, you know, it's, it's each to your own. It's going to be quite difficult. We'll be spending a lot of time with the sander. Uh, yeah, with those tanks, Chris, you generally find that it's one tank inside of another to guard against leaks. All so right, the okay. Outside skin is usually smooth, even if the tank is segmented into different tanks inside. Oh, like I see. On okay. The tank, as you see on the road, yeah, you have about six or seven tanks inside them. Right. But when you look at it from the outside, it's all nice and smooth. Yeah. It's almost a bit like when you look at a steam steam engine, you're not looking at the boiler one on the outside, you're looking at cladding that goes around it. I'm right? with you. So I would be surprised that yeah. you would see the seams. You probably see lots of yeah. dents in them. Yes. Yeah. Not seams on the outside. Yeah. 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 If you look on the web for the photos, all the photos of plastic kids kits and things you can buy for model railways show the seams and all the photos of tanks in real life appear to not have seams yeah yeah so so our challenge here i mean at the end of the day if you don't want to have seams in it or you want to have seams in it is absolutely up to you um personally I, I think from a from my perspective i'll do it without without any seams because that will actually help me show you how you get rid of them um it's going to be quite painstaking i'm afraid so let, let's glue something together because it, it feels like we're doing something then, doesn't it? So we get some, uh, that's a full bottle. Have I got a half full bottle? There I have, yeah. So we'll get some, some Tamiya Extra Thin. Now, the, the, the important thing here with this stuff is capillary action is our friend. So uh, what you'll find is that when you apply this adhesive, you'll just tap it onto, onto the seam and it'll race round the seam very, very quickly. Um, it's really important that you don't get your fingers anywhere near it because what, what it does is it basically will put your fingerprint, uh, mold your fingerprint into the plastic. And I think, John, you were telling me the other day you have already had experience of that. Who, me? No, all my models are perfect. <laughs> I, I certainly have. Uh, where, where you're gluing two halves of a tailplane or something like that together. And, and there's some tricks you can do to, to try and avoid getting on your fingers. But um, so I'm trying to get that as smooth as I possibly can. I'm going to take my, my Tamiya Extra Thin. I'm just going to zoom you in a bit. I, I don't think you'll be able to see the glue whiz round, but um, get my Tamiya Extra Thin and just tap it on. So 
So it didn't race around at all, bless it. Ooh. Interesting. I'm gonna have to paint it round then. Doesn't seem to want to run round. It's very odd. Normally it would just dart down the seam straight away. It probably is doing inside. I just can't see it doing it. So just to be on the safe side, I'm just gonna run it around the, around the seam. There you go. So you wouldn't run the glue around the the male part inside, so that when you put them together, yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah you, you could you could pre-apply the adhesive if you, the uh, solvent if you wanted to, but didn't really feel any need to do that in this instance. Giving it a good. Chris, speed. I noticed that you've got a, a lump of glue on the surface there. Yeah. Um, and it was that intentional. Uh, not really, you know, just 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 where I put it on and it didn't it didn't run as much as I'd expected, but um it'll evaporate and there'll be very little left to see, John. It probably looks a lot worse on camera than it actually is. Right. It's it's very, very thin. So, you know, it wouldn't if I was to if I was to airbrush that you would see it. But you know, I'm not going to because I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with the seams. Um by by the time this is finished. It will just look like one solid piece of plastic, and it's it's the it's the preparation of the of the model before you apply the paint, which which really affects. It's a bit like decorating at home, you know. It's the preparation that that makes the job, not not the actual putting the paint on. Unless you make a complete dog's breakfast of it. When you talk about preparation, Chris. Um... Sometimes in decorating, you just apply thin coat of primer to to things first to highlight the defects. Do you yeah. do that in modelling? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Usually, usually using black paint, and um, because black really makes it makes it pop. So if you, if you really want to know, you see, you see scale aircraft models doing it all the time, where um, that they'll just drift some black paint over the uh, the seam. And then they'll they'll sand it they'll sand it away and see what's left. And if you've got a dip, then the black paint doesn't come out, so you know you've got to fill the dip. So it also makes it very visible. Okay, so thank you're you. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna glue these together in pairs, and uh, and then then glue the pairs together. I think. It's not racing round. Normally it does, so it must be all right. Could that be due due to the temperature, Chris? Might be, yeah. Might be. It's very cold in here. Mine hasn't really raced round either. Although I'm, I've only got the um, the quick setting, of course. But uh, yeah, not, normal it, rim temperature here. It, it probably is, but I probably can't see it because of the way the joint is working. But you normally see it sort of dart round the joint when you. Right, well, judging okay. by the amount of glue I got on my segments, this is going to have to be a segmented tank. It's going to have to be a what? A segmented, a segmented one. No, you'll get it off. Yeah, right. It's it's not don't get it's not an adhesive, so it doesn't it evaporates, it doesn't leave a, a huge great lump like it would have done if you're using the poly cement of years gone by. Quick uh, a quick swipe with the sander and that, that they'll be gone, those marks. That's a little bit tedious, isn't it? Sorry, guys. It's just... 
Yeah, it'd be much better if you picked a different model. <laughs> well, I've got a cupboard full, but they're not all models for model railways, unfortunately. Well, I didn't want I didn't want a deal tank anyway. <laughs> well, maybe got well, steam loco. Maybe you should have. Uh, I should have done the F one hundred four Starfighter then, John. So what scale is that in? One forty eight scale. Uh, no, it won't fit for mine then. <laughs> I've got a, I think I've got a 172nd scale helicopter, which isn't far off scale, is it? No. But it's a Russian thing. Well, I, I definitely think it was a good call to shorten this tank and not have all the rings on. Yeah. <laughs> Judging by how tedious this is. Yeah, well, there is that, yeah. Well, at least that way, John, you've got a lot more spares in case you make a real cock up of it. Well, that's true, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, it is a bit tedious, isn't it? I'm just going to uh, stick a sanding stick over the top of this and just see what it looks like when I've when I've just sanded it. And you'll probably be able to see um, whether you can can you see there where the bit that's still shiny just here and um, that's where the the surfaces of the two parts haven't aligned properly. So what I'll have to do is probably get quite aggressive with it and uh, and sand that surface down so that it it matches but I just I'll just go all the way around and see what it, what it looks beginning to look like. You might find he's put for the molding purposes on that cylinder. He might have put a slight taper on it to get it out of the mold more easily. So they might all be sl one end slightly wider than the other. Yeah, I mean, looking at the way it was in the, um, it's in the sprue, um, not sure, but uh, yeah, so you can see, uh, I'm sanding that, you can see how the middle is still shiny. Yeah, so so the middle is sagging the way the, where, you know, I said it looked like it had all sagged a little bit. So um, I'm going to have to get a little bit more aggressive with it. <clears throat> see what I mean. Weapons that I can use. I don't know the one I want when I find it. Maybe hiding where it is. So you can see as I'm sanding it more aggressively now. See how this shiny bit in the middle is getting narrower? Can you see that? Yep. Use a sponge sander though. If you've got, if you're using flexi grit, then you're okay because it'll come form to the surface. But and you can see there now we're getting to a point where there's there's nothing showing at all in the middle, um, and and that that's. We're pretty close to, to perfection then. 
Yeah, it's coming together quite nicely, that now. I maybe missed it, uh, Chris. What grade are, are you using for this aggressive attack? Yeah, I don't know what it, I don't know what the grades of these are, Les. Um, they, um, I'm using the, a Flory Models uh, sponge sander, but I don't actually know. It would be okay. really useful if he printed the the grades on them, but um, yeah, so I don't, I don't actually know, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. No worries. Yeah, the one I'm using comes with a little chart colour coded for the grades of the different um, ones. Yeah, are you using flexi grip, Pete. This is micro mesh. Oh, is it right? Yeah. Um, I think the, is it like a piece of plastic with an abrasive on it? Um, it's got various. You've got the sticks like that. All oh, right. Yeah. And then it's got the foamy ones like you were showing. Yeah. And then it's got little square pads as well. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that was good. So. so are you just cleaning the glue off now yeah well i'm just tidying the seam up um just to get a feel for you know what we're looking like and it doesn't look too bad actually when you say tidying it up what exactly are you just filing over just yeah, filing so, over it so so what i'm doing um if, if you if you run a sander over it to start with like this what you'll see is you'll see that the um, you can see what's high and what's low. So the, the the gray bits are high, and the shiny bit is low. Can you see that, Pete? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you want is you want to keep sanding it until it starts to look like this, where it's all gray and no shiny bits, and and you're pretty much, you know, you, you're getting you're getting there as far as that seam is concerned. As soon as I start filing it, it all goes very pale grey. Yeah, well, if it all goes grey, that means it's very level. Okay. If, if it doesn't all go grey, like mine hasn't, those yeah. the little shiny bits, that means those shiny bits are low in respect of the, the other parts that I'm sanding. Right. Because I can't reach them with my sander. So you just have to keep persevering with it. I mean, it's, I thought gluing it was, was boring, but watching me sand it must be really boring. <laughs> You're sanding that quite quickly after you've applied the. Oh uh, yeah, the, the glue's the solvent's gone. Yeah, yeah, it's, it doesn't take long, John. I've always had a bad experience with doing that. Have you? Yeah. Well, I've ended up sort of it seems to drag. The, oh yeah, if it's dragging, then because it, I put too much adhesive on it. Yeah, I mean, if it's dragging, then you clearly you, you're going at it too early. So I've got a little seam there. You can actually see a line. Can I, you can probably just see that if I get it in the light. So, so that's that's going to show that. So I'll, I'll keep going at it. Let me go at it with something a little bit more aggressive. See if I can get that out because that's that's going to show. That might need some uh, a little bit of filler on it. I mean, I can see all the tiny, tiny little scratch marks from the abrasive, but that doesn't matter, does it? No, no. But I've got a little line there and I can feel that. And where I've demonstrated what you were talking about earlier by having a finger mark on, on it, what do I do about <laughs> that? Just keep sanding. Leave, leave it to dry. Yeah. Um, and wait till it's really dry and then sand it out. Okay. Hello. I mean, my seam is very, very noticeable. You know, I don't see how I'm ever going to sand that out, but. Right, okay. Mine's, mine's beginning to get there now on this particular one. What I might do is I might just stick a bit of paint on it just to show you hmm. what the, uh, what it looks like. It's always a good, you know, as, as uh, I think it was Mike saying, if you just stick a bit of paint across it, particularly black, it really shows any imperfections. Black's the, the least forgiving of them all. I can um, see the imperfections quite clearly without paint at the moment. All right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's you can actually see the seam quite clearly there. Yeah, let's have a look. 
yeah, you can. Yeah, you need to keep going at it, Pete. Am I not using? Am I being? Am I using too um, fine you a grip? Do you think? Being too gentle. I mean, it doesn't matter if you go in a bit heavy, and um, because you can then lower the grits and bring it back. So you don't. Okay. Want, you don't want sort of sixty grit or anything like that. But um, uh, you've got you've got to get the material off so that it, you can't see the seam. And I remember, I've got a I've got a useful hip for everybody. Go on then. Uh, don't put your coffee cup next to the pot of a plastic adhesive. Yeah. When you put the brush back in the pot, when you're wearing magnifying glasses. How do we know what's coming next? <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that, John, because I'd actually forgotten I'd got a cup of coffee here. It's nearly cold. I think most of us have done that at some time. Mm. <laughs> Mine's usually it's a bit, it's a glass of whiskey usually, so at least the brush is clean. This is when you actually cool. use an old mug for cleaning paint brushes in. <laughs> and you try not to grab the mug and drink yeah. it. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, old old paint uh, doesn't taste as nice as coffee, does it? You will still use jam jars for drinking out of in your end of Leicester, Gary. Perfectly <laughs> fashionable, isn't it, drinking out of a jam jar? So at the moment, mine's looking much worse, having attacked it with the uh, slight, <laughs> not quite so fine grit. I mean, I'm going to see yeah. all these. You see there where it's all far. Is that is that a problem, Chris, or will that just come out again? Oh yeah, it'll come out. Yeah. 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 I mean, look at look at this one that I'm doing, Pete. Can you see? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just yeah, not being. Is... I'm just afraid to go at it. I think that's the problem. Yeah, but you can see there that you see that shiny bit down the middle. Yeah. That's where the plastic has sagged. When it when it was when it was cooling, uh -huh. so I mean it's not it's not massive, but it's got to come out. So um, yeah, I'll I'll go for a bit, and then if it doesn't, if I can't bring it bring it to where I want, then I'll put I'll put some filler on it. Perhaps we'd have been better just throwing away these bits and using a blue roll middle to make the tank <laughs> out. Of. Yeah, yeah, a bit of plastic uh, plumbing pipe <laughs> would do it, wouldn't it? Yeah. That's called scratch building. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. This is pretty scratched. I reckon that's yeah. scratching building. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a bit tedious, but yeah. But this is this is what it's all about, you know. If if you're going to get a perfect finish, then uh, yeah, this is where you need to be. Unfortunately, you need to be patient. Yeah. So I've got quite a lip there on this one. Well, you just build the end gauge model because it comes as a complete cylinder in the kit. You haven't got to have sections. Does it? Yeah. Wouldn't be as much fun though, Cole, would it? Hey, oh, is that the end gauge from the same company, Cole? I, I, do you know what? I'm not sure. I think it is, but I, I had the kit in, in bits in the box for years and I've only just built it. So that's the picture I posted on the forum. Oh, right, the one that yeah. I can't see, yeah. But you only got to press a button and say, Download and you can see it. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm very careful what I download off the internet. <laughs> thing is, you could the thing is you could always stick the end gauge thing at the back of the model and pretend it's a long way away. Yeah, yeah that's There's true. Always that. Yeah, bit of forced perspective. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm nearly good with this one now. I've just got this last little bit to do. Uh, I'm, what I'm not going to do, I'll look and see, show you some other techniques. Um, that will be appropriate for this kit because you know you can crack on and next time next time we reconvene I'd like to think that this this, this cylinders both the cylinders will be done um, but you get a bit tedious just watching me trying to stand this out of here just uh, I've just been past a sanding polishing block from uh, from Susie yeah Apparently Oh, from Boise's of of uh, uh, for acrylic nails. Yeah, yeah. Ninety nine pence. It's, it's foot. It's foam. Oh, and it's got different grades as you go around the cube of it. I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, only for acrylic, acrylic nails. Oh, 99 pence from... Uh, from plastic. Yeah, that's, that's the sort of thing I use, Andy. They're pretty good because they go all the way from being able to have some fairly coarse uh, sanding no, right down no. to polishing. Watch, you can get that's the button one, yeah. And then you get a standing one, so okay. You get two in a pack, so you get in theory, you get two for 99 pence. Okay, there you go. Two two. Nine, you go, they're just getting better and better, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, look out for the bargains when you're from Yorkshire, you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, short arms, deep pockets. Yeah, didn't want to say anything, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. There's um. There's certainly going to be um, parts of it that are going to be visible. I can just see, if I just get it in the light there, can you just see that little white shiny line in the middle? That's going to need a little bit of uh, a little bit of filler on it, but only a tiny bit. No, I'm quite pleased with that. I'm going to, I'm just going to set to on this end piece where it all got scratched as well um, in, in the packaging. So I'm just going to tidy that up. I think I might just glue all these together and work on it as one piece. But... I was going to ask you that, whether you thought that was a, a better plan to put them all together. There's no disadvantage in doing that, really, is there? No, not really, no. I just, I just got excited and wanted to do a bit of sanding instead of gluing. Now I can't wait to do some gluing, to be honest. So if you if you remember when I when I first showed you this piece, it had little scratches all over the end of it. And as you can see, I've just polished polished those scratches out now, so it's a beautifully smooth, shiny finish. So we won't be able to see uh, won't be able to see the, any of the scratches when we come to paint it. I have to say, I'm very impressed with both yours and Gary's workspace it's very clean and tidy <laughs> it's not that tidy colin because the to the right of me um there's, it's an l-shaped work surface there's not a lot of desk space over there <laughs> let me tell you well done it's uh but I've, I've built this set of drawers that comes out about 600 mil and it's designed in a way so that when i've got the drawers open i can put use it as like a, a tool shelf you know like a dentist does so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's quite functional, it's just a little bit untidy today. Yeah, um, it's, on, it's on my agenda to, to, uh, to sort it. I'm only showing the clean and tidy spot on camera. There is a mucky spot. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same. I'm getting a bit obsessive with this now. I'm going to stop doing it. <laughs> I'm I think that's that's a thing of beauty in terms of the first piece. So uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. And as I say, I've got the scratches out of the end there. Lovely. So that's all good. Let's stick another bit on.
ages since I've built a plastic kit. I'm quite enjoying this. Seems to have done nothing but uh, but card kits. Have you had a go with the um, the low relief arches yet, Les? Uh, not so far. I've been somewhat tied up with uh, Merg uh, guinea pigging and stuff like that. All oh, right, my, yeah. First, my study is a, is a study in Burroughs or us. It's uh, that's the next job is to sort out my workspaces. Yeah, yeah. I, I've I've done about six foot of it so far in Engage. Uh -huh. Have you? Very very painful, but it looks all right. <laughs> You ought to have said I'd have cut you some in Engage, Carl. Oh, uh, don't worry about it. It takes all the fun out. The other thing is it's nice and cheap as well because it only cost me the paper to print them out. Yeah, that's true. That's true. The um, the, the laser cuts the arches lovely though, doesn't it, Les? They're really smooth, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah they, do. They, they, look very, they look very good. I, I also, yeah. uh, I've got a planning over the weekend to have a go at the little line hut with your oh, yeah. the laser cut. I'll, I'll see how that goes and uh, maybe report back on that one. Yeah, time. so just you'll notice when you look at that, there's a little window in the kit as well. Uh, yeah, I, I've, uh, I did notice that and I thought, oh, that's a nice idea. Yeah. I so never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, way, the way to do it is just stick a bit of um, cellophane between the two layers to create your glass. Yeah. And then just pop the window in from the outside. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you'll, you'll probably find that you don't even need to glue it in because it's, it's like an interference fit in the, in the opening. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll bear that in mind when I come yeah. to it. Thanks. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I used the same, did the same, um, with, um, the, the large station building that I built. Uh huh. So the, I tried to cut some windows for Gary, but in N gauge, but uh, we couldn't get them. Some, we couldn't do it at that gauge. Too small. Yeah, I, I've ended up investing in. I bought some white acrylic ink, and I use my old drawing office 0.5 millimeter pens, mm. and I, I I print the windows out on film in black, because obviously the printer won't print white, and then I just go over the windows in white. Mm. And it, it takes a long time, but they do look nice when they're finished. I, uh, my, my daughter's bought herself one of these uh, cricket machines. Yeah. For making labels in, in vinyl. Um, so when, when she gets bored of it eventually, you know, I'm, I'm sort of... Yeah, that's what I use to make these windows. Yeah. Here's, here's some I prepared earlier for a barge. And it's a bit shiny because they, they're, I've sprayed, they're stuck to a, there we go. They're stuck to a piece of, um, masking tape for, for spraying and, that, and, and that's with a cricket machine in vinyl yeah it's it's, it's called a silhouette portrait similar similar thing yeah so it's yeah. 10 ten thousand plastic cars and right. and then i've sprayed them with a um a metal paint to make because they're aluminium on the on the boat you see so i'll have to uh, i'll have to see ten ten thousand is that about the same sort of thickness as acrylic well, acrylic comes in all kinds of thicknesses, so. Uh, sorry, um, sorry, vinyl. I mean vinyl, not acrylic. Yeah, it'll cut. It'll cut that all right. Yeah, Crycut will cut it. Yeah. Well, I've been looking at the. And that uh, uh, and that uses STL files exactly the same as a, a laser cutter. Uh, mine doesn't. Mine mine uses a proprietary format, but. Um, Sorry, sorry, Les, you were saying something, I think. Yeah, I, I was just saying that I've been looking at the, I, I had a cricket, one of the original crickets, and they, they, you couldn't do your own designs very easily. Uh, so I consider that was a bit of a waste of money. But I've been looking at the cricket versus the silhouette equivalent uh, re, in the last couple of days. And the silhouette is about, match for match, is about 50 quid cheaper. Um, what the person who was demonstrating said was that the Cricut is, um, software is very easy to use if you don't want to do anything terribly complicated. But yeah. the Silhouette Studio, which is a freebie and you can use with the Cricut, is actually um, very full of uh, clever CAD stuff, which, which gives a bit more flexibility. But there's some yes. quite good, there's some quite good um, videos on YouTube concerning how to use it and the, the various differences between the two of them. 
So yeah. I'm Sil Silhouette Studio. Silhouette yeah. Studio. It's a free. It's a free software which you can use with the cricket. So oh, if you if you use it. So we don't and let, uh, let her practice on it first. Yeah, if you're using, if you're using, if you're used to using CAD programs such as Fusion 360 or something like that, I would imagine that the Fusion, sorry, that the um, Silhouette Studio would be fairly straightforward to get to grips with. But if you want yeah. to do something very quickly, you can you can do quick things in either of them, much the same way you can with Fusion 360. If you just want to do a couple of simple shapes and extrude and, and then get them printed on a 3D printer, then it's, as you know, it's dead easy. Um, but if you want to do something like a lofted um, sh change shape of a tube from square to round or hexagonal or whatever, you can do it in Fusion 360, but it's a bit of a fiddle figuring out how to. But once you've mastered it, it's, it's, it's not a big problem. My problem about that, of course, is remembering how I did it last year. Yeah, that is the same for us all, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I use Silhouette Studio um, for, for doing my die cut stuff, um, but I don't actually do the drawing in um, in Silhouette. I do it in, in CAD and then just import it. What, uh, what, 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 um, what format are you importing it in? Is it DX, SVG? DXF. Oh, DXF, okay, yeah. Yeah. Chris, when you get to the end of the cylinder yeah i have found that um the when you hold it together it doesn't fit inside the cylinder particularly what it doesn't fit had a inside. Bit of a gap. so sorry john what doesn't fit inside the cylinder the little end piece yes so okay what i did what i've discovered by default not by design um is that i applied the adhesive and thought oh well i'll fill the gap and then once you adhesive them, I then put pressure on the lid, and then it clicked into inside the cylinder. All oh, right, okay. You know what I mean. So in other words, it was it was a little bit proud on one side. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be fair, I've just glued mine in, and it went in perfectly. So. Oh right, well perhaps it's just mine then. Well, yeah. They're both were the same. Yeah, I've just done a dry fit, and and it does just click in nicely. Actually, this uh, is a yeah, dry fit. With my yeah. molding then. So I, and I am applying a bit of pressure to it because I want it to ooze a little bit out of the joint on that piece. Just give me something to sand away. So uh, yeah, it's looking good, isn't it? We've, we've nearly got a cylinder. What I'll do then, how are we doing for time, is I'll just spend a few minutes in a minute, I'll just glue this piece, and then I'll spend a few minutes attacking some other bits um, so that you can see some techniques for uh, how we deal with the seams on the tubes and stuff like that. Because we want all them to be nice and smooth as well. I'll just stick some glue on this. You're whistling again, Pete. Sorry, it's... Uh... Yeah, it's interesting. it must be that frequency that microphones are very, very sensitive to because it's I'm using the microphone up here now and it's still picking it up. So I will mute. Thing is, Pete, I can't hear it. Weird, isn't it? Yeah, everybody it else fine, you know, mm, verbally strange. Wise, but can't hear any background noises. How strange, yeah. Uh, it's to do with frequencies, I expect. Frequency response of your um your machine and speakers and 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 all our ears frequency responses are different of course as well but, um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know whether you can talk chris at the same time what you're doing there yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i'm just looking at the base pieces now of the tank yeah um and they are they are definitely they definitely have a mold line in the middle of them yeah uh, all the way around so i've managed to do the base on a big flat file by just rubbing it across to get them so they will sit upright yeah but now i'm coming to the sides and particularly the curved inner piece that goes against the tank yeah what what would you i mean i haven't got a file that's the right radius what okay would, is there I'll show you. A, a recommended way of doing that yeah. or not 
not really. I'll show you. Let me just let me just take. Okay. Well, sorry, I didn't mean to. No, it's okay because I was going to talk. You're about... jumping ahead, John, when the rest of us are trying to do the bit that Chris is on. Yeah, so, well, I, I realise that. I'm saying yeah. I am being apologetic. So this is the piece we're talking about, John, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I'm just wondering if Chris could hold off on that until we. Till... Yeah. It would be my request, but. Uh... Yeah. No problem. I've nearly got a full cylinder. Otherwise, I'm going to get very confused. Look at that look. Is there a yes, tank I have, on both ends? I have my two tanks. I have shortened my tanks, remember? Yeah, they look so good, they're John. Not, not as long. What do you say, Cole? Is there a tank connection on both ends? No, it's only on one end. Oh, so you've not got the trick of making sure they all line up properly then? What do you mean? Oh, the holes, yeah. On the engage version, there's a tank connection on, on one end at the bottom and then the vent connection at the other end at the top. No, it's, uh, look, there's nothing on that one end at all, look. Oh, well, cheating. It's fantastic. Look how shiny that is now. Yeah. Now I've polished the, the scratches out. Please with that. So I'll cover that. Let me just find the sprue. Do you polish with sort of a rotary movement or an up and down yeah, movement? I did on that one. I give it a bit of a spirally kind of affair. Um, I used um, I used yeah. this to start with, so a relatively mild attack on it, um, and then I finished it with with this, which is a, which is a polisher, and uh, yes, yeah, left it quite nice. When you're using these polishers. What you can also do is you can just you know, drop a little bit of water on it as well and just helps uh, helps clear the debris away. I just lick it because I'm, I'm a bit of a heathen. But, uh... So let's find a piece that's fairly big that I can take off so that I don't lose it for the next piece. Whistling again, Pete. <laughs> yeah, so I broadband from my uh, internet thing. Can everybody hear me at the moment? Yeah. Because yeah, Chris's video has gone very jerky. I think it's my broadband connection. Gary, the uh, sanding blocks you put a link on uh, the chat for, I've just looked those up. Do they come complete with the grip paper or do you have to buy that separately? No, it's, it's just the 3D printed block. So there's, there's, all, there's numerous different versions on Thingiverse. So if you just type in the search sanding block, you know, there's some that you know, will provide a flat surface. So you just buy any paper you want, wet and dry, oh, right. okay. or whatever, yeah, yeah, and you, know, you just place it in. It's just got a clamp system. Yeah, no, I understand. It's just got a screw clamp system, and there's all different versions, you know, one with, you know, flat bottoms, the sandpaper across for doing across, you know, round surfaces, and what have you, but all different sizes, widths, lengths. If they're on Thingiverse, we can just download the STL and print them ourselves basically yeah yeah that's it yeah that's what I did well 
So the the arches that you've got for um, uh, where the the uh, laser cutting feet is that a graphic you've designed yourself or managed to find it somewhere? No, it's it's something that I put together, Andy, um, and oh. it's um, in collaboration with John at Scale Scenes. Right. So um, basically, it's a laser cut set of card parts to go with John's kit that you download. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah, they just painstakingly uh, did all the the block work and the brick work and yeah no I you know you don't I don't you don't cut any brick work in it at all it's just plain you download the kit that of the texture that you want from John and then you right ah so it's up. just just the structure that you've made right yes yeah so right. here's right. here's um, which camera are you on are you looking at my desktop yeah yeah so this is John's latest kit which is the uh, arched retaining walls kit. Yes. And and this is a laser cut version of that. So um, you know this will be available on the on my website next week. And then you um, download John. You buy John's kit, and then you buy these, and you put the two together, and you get. I'm with you. I'm with you. What uh, what what sort of cardboard is that you've used on that then? This the two millimeter is something called fin board, um, which board. is a fin yeah F I double N. It's um, it's a reconstituted paper pulp, and, okay. and there's a number of reasons I like it. One is it's nice to work with, um, it's nice to cut, works well with the laser. Yeah, uh, very consistent in terms of its thickness. And what you can also do with it is you can form it, so you can soak it in water, uh -huh. form it round a curve, let it dry, and then when it's dry, it retains that curve. Okay, because I'm still, I'm still, still very much experimenting with the laser cutter. We haven't done a lot on it yet. I'm yeah, still trying to get a decent bed to uh, work up and down and oh, uh, uh, I've got a lot of yeah. um, uh, honeycomb sort of steel, but I'm waiting for the local fabricator to to fold it for me to make a nice uh, a nice bed. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things you might want to consider is um, a pin bed. So, um, and you can make those yourself. So you just get a piece of, um, a piece of timber, you know, a bit of yeah. ply or something like that, a thin ply. Yeah. And, uh, and then stick nails in, a, you know, a spacing of about 25 mil or a grid. Um, okay. So like a bed of nails, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, and then what you do is you then put your material on top of the bed of nails. And when the laser cuts through it, you don't get any scorch marks underneath. Okay. Because what you'll see is if you put it on, on the honeycomb base, you'll see that where the laser hits the honeycomb, it you get a bit of a bounce up. back. Yeah. yeah. And then so what you get, if you when you turn your, your your piece over, you'll see that the surface of your piece has got random scorch marks on it created by the honeycomb. It doesn't yes. matter because if no, you do no. it, you know, but it's it's paint out or sand out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um so so the pin bed works really well. The, the, the downside to it is if you cut in small parts, uh, once the laser is finished, they fall through, they drop out, obviously, because they've been cut out. Yeah. And then if they actually fall under the next bit that you need to do, then they get caught by the laser, and, you know, it's yeah. out of focus and you get a brown mark on it. But, um, yes, yeah. But yeah, that, that's, that's quite good. Um, and what I've got in mind is um, I've got a three, or is it four mil? Three or four mil mild steel plate sitting yeah. on top on top of the honeycomb. And, and the reason why I've got that is, and Tim will keep me honest here, um, but the mild steel, uh, I believe, is not very reflective, whereas aluminium would, is an absolute nightmare. And I wanted something really flat. So it absorbs the laser and kills yeah, anything yeah. redundant. Yeah. So um, yeah, that, that seems to work quite well. Yeah. How are you getting Thanks. on, Pete? Chris, so I've got the tank together and I'm just um, attacking it now to work on all these horrible seams. But uh, Right, okay. All right, well, what we'll do is we'll move on to these other yeah. bits then, Pete. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm in the same boat and I'll put that to one side. Yeah. Somebody was asking me something. Is it you, Les? Yeah, I, just to briefly, just to come back to the fin board, can you cut that with the cricket machine? Um, depends which cricket machine you've got. Um, when I bought my silhouette uh, portrait, they were saying, oh, yeah, it'll cut two mil, it'll do this, it'll do that. It, it won't touch it. Um, right. 
So um, now when you look at the, uh, the silhouette maker, and I think one of the cricket machines, I think they can, they can stick about four kilograms onto the blade. Right. Um, so I would suspect that um, if you've got four kilograms behind you, you could, you could cut it, but it's uh, yeah, it's try it. It's, it's worth, it's worth having a go. I haven't yet got, got a card cutting machine, but I was just thinking of thinking of getting one and deciding yeah. which one and whether it's, or not, but it's not going to be immediately. But yeah. I think for that. The, the most important thing I've found Les is, is cause I bought the, the cheap silhouette portrait, which does a job. Um, two issues with it. One, it has very little force in terms of the weight that it can put behind the blade. So anything that's a little bit thick, it, it just doesn't touch. Um, and secondly, um, you get quite a bit of drift on it, which I haven't been able to correct. So um, if, you, if you're doing a print and cut, so for like, like a scale scenes kit, what I do is I print out the, um, the textures and then I cut them out using uh, the, the, the silhouette portrait. Uh -huh. The top left of the page, it's bang on. It's exactly where you'd expect it to cut. But the bottom right, it starts to drift out. And, uh, and it's not a software alignment issue. I think it's just a mechanical issue because it's a cheap machine. Right. So um, they, they brought out a new machine, I think, called the Silhouette Maker. I think that's the right name. And, um, and that will deliver four kilograms to the blade, but it also uses all the accessories that, um, that the Silhouette Portrait uses. So um, I, I'm probably going to get one of those at some point, and hopefully it'll be a bit more accurate. Yeah, I, I've just uh, talking about it. It's actually the Silhouette Cameo Four and the Cricut Maker, and I've put oh. the link to the YouTube comparison if anyone wants to have a look at that. Yeah, sorry, I got the names the wrong way around, hadn't I? Yeah, no <laughs> worry. Yeah. Cricut Maker and the Silhouette at Four, yeah. Yeah. Cameo, yeah. So, so that's all my cylinder done. So Pete and I are in the same place. I'm just going to make sure it's dry, which it is. Um, so I'm going to take a look at these these two bits now. Um, Not quite the same place, Chris. I'm sure yours is much neater than mine. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's it's. You have a look at it, Pete. You can see it's uh, it's it's okay, but it still needs a lot of work. The truth, yeah. the, the proof of the, you know, we get it sanded and then we get some sticker, a primer coat on it, and we'll be able to see what it looks like. Um, so I'm going to attack this little um, base piece. There's a number of these base pieces that that you know the, the cylinder actually sits on and uh, and as you can see um, there's a bit of flash just here look sticking out and um, there's a seam running all the way around from the two halves of the mold but one on the bottom doesn't really matter because you're not going to see it it's got ejector pin marks inside so um, and you can see those very clearly and um, so I would suggest that if you were putting this in the place on your model where it's side on, you can look at it from the edge and you'll be able to see them. So we need to get rid of those ejector pins. So we'll talk about how we do that in a minute. We need to get rid of the seam. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get rid of that bit of flash. Um, and the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna use my, my trusty scalpel and I'm just gonna run it along the inside of the, the inside of there. It's quite a thick bit of flash actually. I'll just and, and I've got a god awful blade on there. Let me just get a new blade. Right, so I'm out of blades. What do you do with all your used scalpel blades, Chris? I'm a bit reluctant to chuck them in the bin. I do chuck them in the bin, Colin, I'm afraid, mate. Yeah. I mean, Kathy Millet has got a little uh, sharpener thing that she uses. Um, you know, you know, like a, a butcher's steel. Yeah. She's got a little mini one of them. She shot, she I've got about it. halfway through my box of 100 so far in the last three or four weeks. So uh, it just seems a bit dangerous to throw them straight into the recycling bin. Yeah, I put them I put them in a, um, a little container or something like that if I've got one to hand. Yeah. That's how I shop mine. I made up from an old um, tin with a lid on it and I just put a slit in the top. So effectively it's my own homemade sharp spin. Yeah, that's a good idea, Pete. Yeah. Where do you have Where do you have them? You hunt for them when you go to shows. Andy, do you want to mute yourself out, mate? 
Oh, sorry, yeah, well, I'll just show you, Susie's got a little scalpel sharpness. Oh, is she? Right, okay, I can't see you at the moment. Oh, okay, oh. Yeah, no worries, I'll... Uh... I'll have a look in a bit. Right. I'm going to hold it up again, Andy, I just missed it, I've, I've clicked onto your video now. Oh, uh, oh I see, yeah. yeah. Of course, you've got to know how to work it. <laughs> yeah. No different to any other than that. You know, that, that bit's serrated. You know, just, yeah. Oh, just like a, like a normal steel, but... Oh. Yeah, you're assuming that I know how to work a normal steel. So that's another, <laughs> that's another training course Chris could give us. <laughs> oh, dear me. Yeah, I'll tell you what, for Christmas I got... Uh, I, I, in, in my workshop I've got one of these... Um, oh, gosh, what are they called? Um, it's a sharpening machine for woodworking, and I can't think it. Tormec. I've got a Tormec uh, wet um, sharpening machine that I sharpen all my chisels and my plane blades and things like that with. And uh, and I got a, a jig for it for sharpening knives, and, and I did all the kitchen knives, and <laughs> they're absolutely fantastic. But Tracy keeps cutting herself on them now because she's a little bit clumsy and she's got no ends of plasters on the ends of her fingers. They're just, they've come out fantastic. So next time you come up, Pete, bring your knives with you and I'll sharpen them all up for you. Is that, um, uh, is that a vertical sharpener or a horizontal sharpener? It's a, it's a, it's a big wheel um, yep. that goes, this is in the vertical plane. Oh, right. Um, okay. Yeah. And then you have a series of jigs for, for putting on the various different yeah. tools that you, you know, that you, you're sharpening. So, so I'm onto this, um, base piece John that you were asking about and how do we tidy yeah. the seam out the middle yeah this um, another tool that I've got which I didn't show you so I'll, you can do it with a knife but I'll just show you something else here which is quite useful you can you can get these kind of things um, and these these are seam scrapers um, specifically for, for model making um, which will come in really handy when when I start dealing with the seams on here. But if you haven't got one of those, pardon? I said, oh, right. Yeah, oh, okay, sorry. Add, add um, that to your tools list if I'd like one of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can get these in all shapes and sizes. Um, and they're just a very accurately laser cut piece of, of, of steel. But you, you'll see in a minute if I use it that um, it's great for scraping seams off. So, so in this situation here, we've got a seam coming down the middle and we've got a bit of, uh, a bit of flash. So the yeah. way I would deal with it, the flash I would cut with my, with my nice new blade, um, just sort of par it away until the flash has gone, which is kind of where we're at now. And then what you can do is you can use your, your scalpel like a, like a cabinet scraper. So you hold it vertically to the surface and and just scrape it down the down the seam and you'll probably see that the seam starts to just roll off as i do that can you see it yeah yeah so you know don't go like a bullet a gate at it you've got to be gentle because you'll end up with all kinds of gouges if you're not careful but you can gently take the seam out i mean to be honest john this one's not that important because you won't be able to see it. Yeah, because the tank's going to be set on it. But you want to take the seam out anyway so that the tank sits nice and flush. So just oh, gently, yeah, that works. Yeah. So just gently take the seam off. So you, would you do the same thing with the outside? Yeah, I would, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, you've got the advantage on the outside that um, and you need to be careful the way they've. Yeah, this is this is weird. This piece because it's actually tapered slightly. Yeah, so I was looking at. Yeah, so I think I would probably I just have a go at it with a with a blade just to see what it looks like. Yeah, so it's almost it is tapered. Mm. So you get, you get, guess you've got a number of options there. You could just sand it flat. And I think that's what I'll do. So I'm going to get a fairly aggressive sanding stick. Right. 
We decided it was desperate. That's what I need to do. That's the plan for this afternoon. Almost on the sixth one. So this, this sanding sticks, another Flory Models one, it's got a, a flat hard surface on one side and it's got foam on the other. So I'm gonna use the flat one for this and I'm just gonna work away at this, uh, the edge of this, um, this base piece until I'm happy that I've got it nice and flat the way I want it. And you can see where, where I've sanded it, you can see how tapered it is. It doesn't look like it's lined up particularly well in the mould. Is yours the same, Pete? Yes, very much so. Do you think the taper is as designed, that it should have that taper, or just that that's how it's come out? I don't, I genuinely don't know, to be honest. Um, I suspect it wouldn't have the taper because um, it looks like a, a welded steel construction, doesn't it? So, yeah, I'd agree with you, Chris. I think that's, it shouldn't have the taper. This is where um, this is where the, the little desktop sanders can be quite useful when you're doing bits like this. So it's quarter two. So um, I'll just quickly show you how to deal with the seams on the pipe work. And then I'll show you quickly how to deal with the ejector pins. So when you've got a piece of pipe work like this, um, let me see if I can get the seam to show in the light. I don't know if I can actually. You're gonna to have to take my word for it that there's a, a very, very fine seam down either side of, of this pipework where um where it's been in the mold. So you can use a you can use a knife just as I did previously, um, but you have to be very careful because you want to get rid of the you want to get rid of the the seam, but you don't want to leave a flat. So just very gently drag the knife along the seam and and slowly it will disappear so so that's one way of doing it and um, the next way of doing it is when you could use something like this particular scraper because it's got various different size holes in it at the top and you just find the one that fits the the gauge of the tube that you're doing which would be that one and then i would just scrape that along and you can see see how it's bringing the it's bringing the seam off, but it's leaving a curved surface underneath. And I'm, I'm being really gentle with this. Um, let's see if I can do it in a different way so that you can see it actually happening. I'll bring you in a bit. Oh, that's out. So you can probably just see, you can see that line along the, the seam just there. Can you see it? I think you will be able to. Can you see that, John? Different glasses. I, I can see it, Chris. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, so what I do is put this little scraper on it and just gently drag it along. I'm trying to do it in an angle so that you can see it actually happening. It's quite difficult. But can you see it's just lifting the, lifting the seam off? Yeah, that's yeah. showing nicely, Chris, thanks. Yeah. So, so that's what you. That's where these things you know, become 
really useful because they've already got a curved surface. And as long as you don't go crazy, you're not going to get a flat on it. So I'm just going to finish that off. I mean, they're not cheap, these things. I think about a fiver or something like that, probably slightly more, but they're extremely useful. And where did you say you got that from? Were you? I can't remember. I'm going to have to look it up, John. It was from a, from a specialist model uh, place. They're, they're not kind of readily available, um, but I will find it and I'll put it on, on our list of useful suppliers. Okay. So I'm just going to continue with that. And, and this, this is, it would be a useful tool for, for the model rail enthusiast because, you know, we have lots of pipes, don't we? Sort of gutterings and stuff like that drain pipes and the like. So, so that's eradicated the seam. Um, and you could almost, you, you could probably go, yeah, I'm okay with that. But then if you wanted to just go that extra mile, then take a sponge sander and just finish it off with a sponge sander. And you should find that the seam has completely disappeared, which it has. And you, you need to do that with every little bit of this pipe work. Pain in the backside, but it will make all the difference to the model. Trust me on that one. quite fiddly where the seam goes round the little um i suppose it's the fixing bracket or something that's round yeah, the, the round yeah. the pipe it is so so the way i would approach that is i, I use a sponge sander and um, because I've, I've left quite a bit on that as you can see it's sticking out i've left quite a bit out on it when i cut it off the sprue to give me something to go at so i'm just going to very very gently start to take that away Is Chris, is that the hard backed um, edge that you're using there? No, I'm using the sponge edge. Right, okay. Because I'll always use a sponge when I'm sanding on a surface, right. a, a curved surface. Yeah. The only time I'll use the hard back is when I'm on a flat. Right, okay. Going, going back to the hard back one, does it have a flurry number I, identifier on it? Uh, Your part number? Yeah, I'm just looking for the packet. Bear with me one second. He does a he does a range um, that you can get as a pack, and it does. But this particular one is the uh, it's the three sander dual pack, uh, dual sander three pack. Sorry, and it's FMS zero two four, Foxtrot Foxtrot Mike Sierra zero two four. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. I've actually yeah. got the um, Flurry model starter pack on screen at the moment, so I'll see if it's in that. Yeah, I think that I think that's years ago. I think that's what I what I actually started with. What you can do, Pete, as well, if you're working on that little where that collet is around the tube, you can you can even scrape. You know, here where there's a little seam actually on the face of it. And um, let me just move my hand, sort of there. You can you can bring your knife in and then scrape away from the tube and that will just remove that little bit of uh, seam from there as well but i've got a little bit of hey can i just give you a bit of a tip about sir, sanding curved surfaces this is yes you can years ago when i did my apprenticeship when uh, the first year of your apprenticeship was just filing a proper <laughs> oh oh uh, you, you should, if, if you look, look at if you, oh, you, you're clipping off, Andy. Oh, uh, can you can you see my camera or not? I, I can't, not at the minute, and I've got my keyboard connected, so oh, it's not yeah. not easy for me to, to change it. Oh, oh, but if you if you file, if people are watching it, if you file it in that sort of way, you, you get a perfectly radius curve. Oh, oh, 
Know that's that's useful to that's really good to know because counter it almost seems counterintuitive because you're it moving does. in the opposite curve, aren't does, you? But, but believe me, that's that's the way you can file or, or sand a curve in, in that ah. sort of oh yeah. You have, you have to show um, me I've not got my keyboard spent, connected, so spent three months filing at Mark County on the electrical apprenticeship, but we, we were taught the same thing. Yeah, yeah. three months filing. <laughs> I don't know. Useful tip. It's 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 nice it's nice to know that the old skills we learned sixty years ago are still going strong. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, well, I've, I was, uh, I've oh, still got my reading files from my apprenticeship in the box upstairs. They're the ones I use. My, my apprenticeship was four years long. I guess yours might have been a bit. You might, you might have been on a five-year apprenticeship, was you, Les? Yeah, six, from sixteen to twenty-one. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. yeah. None of this. None of this. Uh, two uh, two months training course. Like oh, so mine was a five-year. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I I found my my indenture documents a few a uh, few weeks back when I was rummaging through. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> took, <laughs> took me back a bit. Did that. The right. Part of my apprenticeship was was doing the first year of college was all about valves. Oh, you of lucky lad! The semiconductor thing took over, so we had to do the first and second year in the in the in the next year on the semiconductors, which was very painful. I bet. I bet. Right. I'm conscious of the time, and um, and I just want to cover ejector pin marks, um, which are these little circle things that we talked about earlier, and 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 they can be in two forms really. They, they can be proud of the surface or they can actually be um, below the surface. So the first thing you need to identify is whether they're proud or whether they're um, below the surface. And the easiest way to do that is just drag a blade across it and feel where it clicks. And, and these, these are below the surface, right? So they're effectively holes that are below the surface. So we have to deal with that. No amount of sanding is going to address that because um, yeah, we need to fill it. So, so the question is, how do we fill it? Um, and what we will do, I'll just go, I've got it here. This is where I would use something like this. Um, so this is the, uh, the Mr. Hobby uh, Surfacer 500, which is quite a gloopy um, filler, but it, it's self-leveling. So, and you want an old brush for this, nothing too exotic. This is solvent based. So uh, the cleanup is with um, cellulose thinners. So what I'll do is I'll just grab a bit of that on the end of my brush and drop it in the, drop it in the ejector pin and let it kind of settle out a bit. And if you can see that, try and get it the right way around. So you can see all I've done is put a blob of it in the ejector pin hole. Do the same again. It's really weird because, you know, I'm trying to work out where your hands are when you're looking at everything back to front. Very difficult. But I'm basically going to fill these ejector pins with a, with a blob of, of this stuff. It goes off very quick. Smells fantastic. When you're doing that, uh, watching your own video, I think you've got an option on video setup to reverse the image. Oh, have you? Oh, okay. I've not got my keyboard connected at the minute, Gary, but um, I'll bear that in mind for next time. Just trying to work out. So you can see this is already beginning to skin over on this lid. Because we've all been brought up looking at ourselves in mirrors, so our brain is so used to seeing us mirrored. So yeah. yeah, and you can you can duplicate that effect on Zoom with a setting, yeah. Worth knowing, thank you guys. So all I'm doing is just filling this up with this stuff. It's self-leveling to some extent. So and this is the 500, so this is the thick, the thick grade. And you want to get enough in eventually. I mean, it might you might need to do two coats. You need to get enough in so that it's slightly higher than the um, than the surrounding plastic. Mm. 
I'm just gonna have to go and grab some thinners to clean this brush. I won't be a second, it's over near the spray booth. Also taking it downstairs into the workshop, so uh, we'll see if this will this will clean it up. Did you say it had to be cellulose thin thinners, not just white spirit? Yeah, this this I think I use thinners for this. I don't know if white spirit would do it, Pete. I'm just trying a bit of uh, a bit of um, lacquer thinner to see if I can clean it with that. But yeah, again, but cellulose thinners wouldn't do it either. I, I'm not serious. I'm sorry. Um, enamel thinners wouldn't do it, would it? No, no. I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, you could always try it, but um, I just want to get that clean, which I've done. So you, you said before about um, there have been a five, 500 and a 1,000. So the 1,000 is thinner than the 500? Yes, it's finer. Yeah. But I've used five hundred. Right, where there's the marks on the back, Chris, that you've filled, are there other positive marks on the front? Is it on the other no. side? No, no. So it's where the it's where the pins come out and punch uh, punch the the item out of the uh, out of the mold. Yeah, I and just what, didn't know whether whether it displaced the plastic on the front because obviously it's punched it on the back. Yeah, no, it doesn't. No, the back's nice and flat. Look. Okay. So what what, what sometimes happens is. When the ejector pins retract, if they don't retract level with the surface, let's say they retract slightly less, you know, maybe uh, a foul lower than the surface, then the, the effect on the mold is that you get a lump. And then so then you just sand those off. What's happened here is that the, the mold is, the material is still relatively soft when they ejected it and the pins coming out have created a hole in it, which is why I've had to fill it. That's why you get a difference where sometimes the ejector pins are proud because of the where the level of the pin is in the mold. And sometimes you get a hole, which is what we've got here. So so the first part of it if you, if they'd been if they'd been sticking out, Chris, sanding those would have been really difficult in, in those tiny little Well, bits I'm gonna between. cover that. Yeah, because yeah. that they are difficult, you're right, Pete. And and it's there's a number of different tools that you can get. And um, you know, there's there's all kinds of manufacturers that make um, very pointy sanding devices. Um, you know, some that actually taper to a point like a pencil with a with an abrasive all the way round. Um, I've never used those, but I can imagine that for things like this, they would be extremely useful. So, so what I do is I use a skinny stick, which is one of these little sanders, and um, and then I just cut it with my cutters. To a point on one corner. So I end up with a little skinny stick that's got a point like that on it. Yeah, and then then when when this is dry, and I'll leave it probably, um, you know, an hour or so, I, I'll just get in there and just gently rub that off. You know, you, you don't get a lot of room, but I've got now because I've cut it to a point, I've got enough room to just get in and give it a little sand. Um, very difficult to get it perfect, um, but uh, if you persevere, you, you'll be able to do it. I think it'll need another coat looking looking at it, because I think the, uh, although I've put some filler in it, it still looks like it might be sitting a little bit low. So yeah, very tiny bit of, uh, you know, pointed uh, sanding stick, get it in there and give it a jiggle round. It, it sands off beautifully, this stuff, so, uh, yeah, it won't be too arduous, but I, what I'll do is I'll um, I'll do that and then I'll show you the results um, you know, when we do the next session. How, how long does that, filler, that particular Mr. Um, filler take to dry, Chris? Um, it doesn't take very long, Andy, um, but, but um, because I've put a blob on of it, yeah. I'm, I'm reluctant to, to actually dive in and start sanding it until I've left it at least an hour. Yeah. Um, now, if um, what I should have done while I'd got the um, while I'd got the paintbrush in my hand, in fact, let me do it anyway. Because one of the things that, that I've got with this particular piece 
is I think there was one area just there. You just see that little white line. It's just a slight depression in the, in the seam. So what I can do is I'll just, I'll just stick a bit of Mr. Filler on it. Mr. Surfacer or whatever you want to call it. Um, so in any kind of imperfection that I think I can see, just with the naked eye, I'll just whack a bit of this on. You see there where I cut it off the sprue. There's that little line. So I'll just stick a bit of that on there. I'm gonna put a bit around there as well. And you can see where I'm painting it on. You can see that the seam is very good because you would see the seam just jump out at you if it wasn't level. Anyway, I'll leave that for a minute, let it dry, and then I'll sand that off. And you'll see the effect. So any questions on everything we've covered? Has it, has it been any good? Has it been useful for anybody? It's very useful, Chris. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Learned loads. One right, question, yeah. um, uh, maybe for you or maybe for Andy. Um, you showed us that technique for getting a nice radius when you're filing. One thing I struggle with, and it might just be my incompetence, but when I'm trying to file something that's dead flat, I'm exaggerating here, but I find it very difficult that there isn't a bit of that or a bit of this or, you know, as I'm filing, how do you keep when you're filing something absolutely dead flat so you get a flat surface? Is there any, are there any master tech, managing techniques for that? My, my experience of that is you just have to spend a bit of time practicing the art of filing the edge of a piece, take a, a decent size, a reasonable file, a bit of quarter inch mild steel, um, just practice filing it and check how flat or, or level it is with a, with a square. It's one of these <laughs> things where you have to actually do a bit of it with, with, yeah. a, with some me me means of measuring how well you're doing. And a piece of mild steel, uh, I don't know, a medium file in your vice with and, uh, a little tri-square or, or a set square um, to yeah. I guess uh, yeah. holding a workpiece secure in a vice is the, yeah. big, the key. big help, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. One of the um, things that I've practiced to do when you're filing something, I've got a big file here that I'll explain what I use this for in a minute, but it's keeping it parallel to what your, to your work surface. So if you've got something sitting upright, it's keeping that parallel. And the tendency is, as Pete quite rightly says, if you, you sort yeah, of go like that. It. Uh, you know, so it's keeping the same with sharpening chisels, you know, keeping yeah. them, the chisels at the constant parallel to the, the flat surface. So what I've done on these Thorntons, um, I've put the, the chisel on my bench and I've actually filed the Thorntons, leaving the file on the bench yeah. because I found I can control the, the, I don't know what these are. No, they're not Thorntons, are they? Well, whatever they are. The brackets. Stands, the yeah. Board things. I yeah. found I can control it more easily than trying to do it, you know, by hand. Yeah. yeah. The, yeah the, that... the other thing you can try, Pete, and, and especially when you get into the end of the filing, is is um, uh, what's called draw filing. Oh, and, and you might, you know, if you're doing a surface, oh, just draw the file like that. Oh. Mm. That, yeah, then you could control the angle a bit better rather than filing like this. 
your draw filing, oh, and that, that's a technique towards the end of your filing to get a nice surface finish. Because the other thing too is files only, well, I don't know, maybe this is a sweep is that maybe wrong, but most files only cut in one direction. Yep. And I think there are files that do in both. I, w I was thinking more of the sanding that we're doing here rather than filing metal. So, so this, this uh -huh. base piece, for example, this little bit on the here, where, where we decided we didn't want the bevel in here and trying to get it flat. Yeah. Um, it's the techniques there. So, yeah. so I wasn't thinking, I and mean, obviously it is all great, great stuff to learn about filing metal as well, but, but I'm thinking how, how it applies here where we're using sanding sticks on plastic. Yeah, I'd put the sanding it, it stick actually, on the bench, Pete. Pete it actually, yeah. it's, it's actually the same, uh, whatever material you're filing. Yeah. Um, the, the idea of using the bench plate, as uh, Chris has on his screen at the moment, you can, you've got much more control uh, you can feel what's happening with the piece of plastic that you're, that you're trying yeah. to get right. Feel that straight away, actually, just trying that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, other, the other thing you might find, although this does tend to apply more to metal than the, the plastics, is you file across the, the piece, not along it. If you're filing along the length of a piece with the file, you'll get it, or you'll get a bow or in the middle yeah. of it. But if you file across at a slight angle, slight diagonal angle, you'll get it much flatter. Um, yeah. I'm guessing it would apply the same with plastics. It's just quite out yeah. of these. Yeah, these yeah I found that too, uh, Nigel, that the, the diagonal um, sweep of the file does give you better accuracy and, that, and actually a better finish. You can see on the surface how, how it's going. Not quite yeah. sure where that should be, but it just happens to be the way the light falls, I expect. And then as... Um, as Andy was saying, draw filing to, to get a nice finish at the end. Yeah, yeah, which of course is impregnated into you after the first three months of your apprenticeship. <laughs> yes, I, I actually remember draw filing from school and metalwork, but the draw filing technique could work just as well with a sanding stick. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right, Peter. Yeah. Andy, I can see you now. Do you want to show me what you were doing with that sander? The radius, the radius. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so. I need to see myself just make sure I'm in front of the camera. Where's my bloody mouse gone? Um, so, so yeah, if you've got a round object, yeah, you file file a round object in that sort of pattern. Oh yeah, yeah. And it, it, so it does feel um, uh, uh, the wrong the wrong thing, but it does get you the perfect radius curve. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Rather than trying to hold the uh, the file uh, flat. Yeah, rather rather than going like this. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. Well. Yeah, doing doing that sort of yeah understand yeah cool thank you i'm just i'm just working on these uh, seams on this piece um I like which, them, them seam removers i found i found one on uh, um uh, what do you call it um chinese um Ali, aliexpress just found yeah one. yeah that's yeah that's probably yeah I'm sure this. I'm sure this one came from China. I just can't remember where. Uh, has anyone used AliExpress recently since Brexit? The, the sticking X. Yes, I, I have. Um, yeah, and the sticking bloody rat on it out there. Well, none of the transactions I've done have. So maybe it depends on which store within AliExpress. Ah, I don't right. know. Okay. I mean, I've been buying connect electronic connectors, and um, yeah. it's just been the same as it's always been. So um, okay. I don't know. Strange. Maybe I was just unlucky then. Yeah. Looking at the micro drills we were talking about earlier on eBay, I've noticed the prices have gone up for the ones from China from when I bought last year. So it looks like they asked on everybody. Yeah, it's a good excuse. Yeah. Clap the price up. Oh, yeah, been... that's Brexit, mate. Sorry. No. You know, carrots yeah, used to be, carrots used to be when... 50p a pound. Now they're £1.50 a pound. Regardless of whether it's true or not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the thing about China, though, is that they've been getting away for, for years with um, special status for undeveloped country. So they've, yeah. been getting a spe they've been getting a cheaper rate. But, um, stuff coming from China to Britain shouldn't really be affected by Brexit because we've had no. agreements with China. No, I was, I was yeah. saying it's an excuse. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're right. I mean, there, will be, yeah, you get... there will be the excuse aspect. Yeah. Of, uh, but coincidentally... 
Oh, yeah, sorry, coincident with Brexit have been changes to the way to the customs VAT limits for bringing things in without having to pay the VAT. So it does that affects other countries as well. It just they decided at the same time as Brexit to make that change. So. Right, you get all sorts guys. of um, you get all sorts of weird uh, descriptions on the uh, uh, on the customs label, don't you? And, um, yeah. You can resist, isn't it? It'll it'll come up with some soft toy or or something like. That. <laughs> oh. So. That, that's pretty much us, I think, for today. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, there's, uh, We'll be doing another one. It's the first Saturday of every month. So um, I'll, I'll continue with this kit and uh, hopefully be in a position where uh, we might start looking at, at, at painting it next time and uh, and maybe start having some discussions about, about weathering um, and the like. Uh, unless anybody's got any kind of other subject matters that, that they would like me specifically to cover. Oh, um, that sounds perfect to me. Yeah. Just how far on the assembly are you going to go before you decide about painting? Do you, do you fully assemble it or is it in like sub-assemblies? Yeah, probably sub-assemblies. I, I, I probably, um, in terms of the cylinder, um, I'll, I'll probably, I'll certainly put a coat of primer on the cylinder before I put the bait, put the, feet on it because I want to see that the cylinder is perfect and if I put the feet on it makes it really hard for me to sand it so um, I'll complete the cylinder and I'll give it a coat of primer and, and make sure I'm happy with it. Will the, will the glue still work through the primer then when you put the, put the stands on it? Oh yeah yeah it will yes it, it melts the paint as well yeah, you know, so you, you have to be a little bit careful. You can't go like a bullet at a gate with it because if you stick loads of it on, it will melt all the paint all over the place. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, you, you'll you'll be able to just just a little bit of glue, just just tap it on, and uh, and it will be fine. So if you if you're doing uh, weathering next week, I think I'll be pushed out the way, and Susie will be in front of the camera. Yeah, well, I'll be it will be next month. Uh, that's, so uh, yeah, next month. That's yeah. uh, that's. I'm just holding up uh, Susie's latest creation now. Oh, I can't see you again now. Oh, that was the uh, the, the uh, standard Hornby steampunk like. logo. That's what, like. that's, that's what it did look like. Oh, and it was really pants. It was like you know some school kid had done it. And that's Susie's uh, add-ons and weathering. Very impressive. Oh. Yeah. So we're, we're doing a we're, we're doing a steampunk themed um, layout next. You know, I want to do a fantasy one. Right. <laughs> has anyone seen the Has anyone seen the Fred Flintstone fantasy layout? I was doing the circuits when we was allowed to go on missions. No. no, I've not seen it. Oh, there's, yeah, it's a, it was fantastic. It had um, you know, it had bones for the uh, connecting rods on the locos and oh. <laughs> Yeah, uh, really, you know, gone to town on making it, you know, really themed and yeah. Oh, blimey! We've got some inspiration that yeah. Oh, uh, bugger the vivid counters. We're going to do a, a fantasy one. Oh. Chris, before we uh, you close down, yeah. I'd like to ask you a quick question about removing these handrails from the sprue. Is there a a trick? Because what I find with thin things when I've Done this in the past. I've always tried to snip them off the sprue miles away from the handrails. I've I've already glued my brakes in the handrail, so they now are attached right within the sprue. But yeah. it, is there a, a method to re, I mean, would it be best to try and remove it with a perhaps a slitting disc in a drill rather than? Uh, the trouble is when you use snips, they produce a. a pressure don't they when it has yeah they do yeah yeah so is there a a secret i think i think what i'd be tempted to do with them if you can see can you see my screen i can yeah i think i think what i might be tempted to do th this one here is the, is the most troublesome okay because when you when you try and cut that it's going to force the handrail this direction and yeah. it would probably snap it so um, these joints here, I've really no issue with um, because it, you could do those with, it, with a pair of cutters. And I think, and this is where 
you know, the coming back to the question that, that Pete had about can he use his, his track cutters, um, cutters with a very, very fine point um, would, be, would be more than capable of cutting that without doing too much damage. I mean, it will force it that way. So there's a danger that it would snap it. Um, if I got something that was really delicate like this piece here, then, then what I'd probably do is I'd probably just gently stroke it with a sharp knife uh, and eventually it would, it would break the, the connection as that's not putting any strain whatsoever on the part itself. No. Okay. So it's, it's not a great design that, to be honest. Um, I mean, you can see already that this, this one here is already broken. Yeah. On mine, so uh, that was a place mine was broken as well. Yeah, so it's yeah. Got clearly a weakness within the. It is, yeah. I mean, they they've put a like a supporting arm on here, but even the supporting arm's broken there. So so, but yet the supporting arm is remaining um, on this piece, or half of it is. Mm. So you know that that will be a tricky bit to cut off as well, because when you're cutting that little bit off there, you don't want to break the rest of this. So you will have to be very careful with, with these parts. But yeah, I'd probably do that and just gen just gently um, go through it with a knife. And, and I'd probably, if I, when I was applying a little bit more pressure, I might even just put a little block of wood or something like that underneath the, the area to support the part. Yeah. Just to give it every chance that you can probably give it. I'm, I'm so what you're saying, you know, it, it, there's not really a trick. It's more there's no trick, gentle no. and... If there is, I don't know. Bit, yeah, careful about... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only thing I thought of was a slitting disc and a mini drill, you know, where you're actually cutting, cutting it yeah. rather than. I think that's so you can take so the up screw away yeah. from it. Yeah. And then deal with it with the screw still attached a little bit, still attached, and then yeah. deal with it. Uh, yeah. Because by cutting it, you wouldn't be use push producing any uh, outward pressure on the. That's true, oh, you? but you know, I wouldn't want to go into an area as tight as that with a slitting disc. No, no, no. I meant so. For instance, where your knife is, yeah. where that upright is that goes up, that yeah. one, I'd perhaps cut in the middle of those the two that go either side. Yeah, yeah, you could. So you sort of got it separated a bit, and then you, deal with you, it. You could. Yeah, I don't know if it, it would help, but I mean, it, it, yeah, there's no trick that I'm aware of other okay. than just be very, very careful. Is that would be my advice. Okay, thank you. Let's see if uh, if I can if, if I can sand any of this. <laughs> yeah, it looks it looks dry. Some of it does. Let's just see. Yeah, it needs some more color on it. Yeah, it needs more filler. It's still below the surface, so I'll, I'll put another blob of uh, another blob of Mister Mister Surfacer on there. Um, yeah, I will get those out, even if I have to put filler in all the way. You know, if I have to flood it with 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 filler, um, I'll get rid of the I'll get rid of the mark, so you won't see it. But I'll, I'll report back on the next modelers medley as to. You, you, didn't, you didn't scratch or rough up the surface when you put the filler in. Does, does it like bond to the plastic? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. it's quite, it's quite, it's, it's absolutely rammed full of solvent. So yeah, um, yeah it sticks really well. I'll tell you what we could do just quickly is I could just um, sand this off, couldn't I? Because I've uh, over there because I've put a bit of this um, Mister Surfacer on here just to see what that looked like. While you're doing that, Chris, you said you would probably put some primer on that. What type of primer will you be using so I'm prepared for yeah. next time? Uh, well, there's all sorts of primers you can get, Pete. Um, I'll show you my, my favourite, um, which is an AK product. So this is um, AK's primer and micro filler. So it does give a little bit of a build when you use it. Um, so it, it's quite nice. It takes the imperfections away quite nicely, um, and it, it's it sands really easily. So when you um, you know if you were to put a coat of this on and go, oh yeah, I need to do some more sanding, then within you know half an hour you can sand it without a problem. There are primers available from people like Vallejo and um, and others, but they're an acrylic-based primer. 
And what tends to happen is if you try and sand them too early, and when I say too early, even within an hour or two hours, they peel as you sand them. And uh, you have to leave them like 24 hours before you can actually get in there with confidence without, because once it starts peeling, you've, <laughs> you've got a problem. And um, so, so this is the one I use. Um, I just, just happen to like it. Um, you you airbrush sprays, that, do you? Yeah, it sprays really well. Um, it, it's the consistency is is so light that I can airbrush it straight out the bottle. And what do you use as a? Uh, I mean, is is it is it acrylic based or enamel based or? Um, I mean, I'm thinking of what you need to clean the airbrush with afterwards. Or yeah, yeah. Just looking to see what it is. I, I would I would um, clean my airbrush with some some uh, lacquer thinner, something like this. Yeah, but. Um, they, so there's a lot, lots of lots of different things I've got to get in there, you see. So because yes. you've got yeah. them all to hand, I haven't got any of these things. No, so. I understand, understand. Yeah. So um, it doesn't actually say what the base is, but um, I'll see if it'll clean up with white spirit, Pete, and I'll let you know. I think it will. Um, okay. What what they do, these guys, is they um, they they have their own um, um, thinners. So, uh, and charge you a lot of money for them. They call it extreme cleaner. And it says, uh, very important to clean it with the extreme cleaner. <laughs> very mm. important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, um, because of its finest components. Also you use the cleaner for diluting your paint. So, um, yeah, so I I'll give it a try. I'll let you know what dilutes it, if that's all right. I don't, I I've got some, I just use this stuff, this, this yeah. uh, Mr. Hobby. Uh, leveling thinner. I, I use that Mr. pretty Hobby much. For, okay. Yeah, I use that pretty much for everything. Um, right, so I'm just going to have a go at this where I put this um, where I put this uh, Mr. Circus around. So you'll be able to tell by how much Mr. Surfacer is left as to how good my uh, my seam was. You can see a little bit of it there. There's a little white line there. Can you see that? Yeah, and that was the line that I pointed out before, which is the reason why I put the Mr. Surfacer on it. Right, Chris, I'm going to have to go shortly because I'm. All right, gonna, John. I need to get myself. Oh, I haven't announced the winner because I was going to and then I got interrupted. Oh, yeah. Let me just. Um, well, two people have gone. You've got. No, Gordon's gone already and has gone. Both leaving. Thanks for the chat. Okay. <clears throat> Keyboard back on. Right. Right, okay. So, because I was about to announce it before and I got interrupted. Um, I can't remember why, but anyway, I did. So, so the winner of the, uh, of the Modelers Medley, I'm really pleased to announce, I'm just gonna stop my share, so I can see everybody, um, is, um, is, small drum roll, please. <laughs> Alistair. <laughs> Alistair. Yeah, Yay! Alistair is the winner of the... <laughs> I don't know if he's... Well I, can't see... I can't see you, Alistair, so I don't even know if you're there. Yeah, he is there, yeah. Alistair McClain. Sorry, sorry, I was on the phone as well. All yeah, oh, right. <laughs> you, well you, done, are the, you are the winner of the, of the uh, group build. Brilliant. That's excellent. So, uh, so um, if it's okay with you... I will share your email address with John Whiffen at uh, Scale Scenes. Yeah, cool. Yes, I uh have. -huh. Yeah, and then he will email you a £10 voucher that you can use to purchase his kits. All right, excellent. I've al already got a ton of his kits, so I'll just need to add some more to it. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, did you know that it does come with a, uh, with a, a secondary reward? 
it means now you can do a presentation on one of his kits. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't quite hear you, yeah. John. <laughs> one way transmission. So I'll just I'll just quickly show you this. I'll put my camera back on. I'll just quickly show you this and then um, and you'll see where the um let's get the right camera. So here we are. If you look at this where I put the where I put the Mr. Filler on um or the Mr. Surfacer. You can see, just see that little white dot just there? That's the point where the model was adjoined to the sprue. So it had left a small hole, even though I tried to cut it off carefully. So that's been filled up. And um, there's a little bit, there's, there's another part where it was joined to the sprue, that's the other side. Um, and then there's a little bit of a white line just there. You can probably just see it, get it in the light. See that little white line? And that white line is the Mr. Mr. Surfacer. So that, that would have shown when we painted it. If we paint that now, you won't be able to see it. And there you are. And I'll do, I'll do that for the rest of it. And then I'll prime it up and it should be perfect. Any questions from anybody before we wrap it up? Are you going to prime it before next time? If so, can you video yourself doing it? Yeah, can do, yeah. Because yeah. I think that's, you know, you're getting into using the airbrush then, which is obviously overlaps with the previous one, but I'd like to see how you actually do it and then well, what know I can what do, I'm Pete, trying to achieve. Yeah, what I can do, Pete, is I've got two of these to do. Mm. So so I can prime one up to, to see what it looks like and show you what it looks like, because what I'd like you to be able to see, and hopefully um, I don't get it perfect, is what I'm hoping. Um, I'm not deliberately going to mess it up, but I'm hoping that the primer will demonstrate that although I was very diligent with the sanding, um, I've still got some little marks that I need to address. So I'll spray one up, but I won't spray the other one up. Brilliant. Yeah, that's but, a good idea. And you can show us doing it, can't you? Yeah, yeah, I'll show you how I recover from any marks, if there are any. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, and then I can actually actually airbrush it. Yeah. And that, um, that primer you'll use, because obviously one of the things we discussed when you did airbrushes was preference for acrylics because of the fumes and, 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 and so on and et cetera, compared to using enamels. What's yeah. that primer like in terms of fuminess and extract? So you need it, you need your proper extractor is really yeah, what you're saying. Yeah, put a, put a face mask on. Yeah, or both. yeah. well, the thing is then the fumes are still floating around the room if you haven't got an extractor, aren't they? Well, so. there, is, there is that, yeah. Yeah, yeah ventilate the room well. Mm. Uh, and you, you're supposed to have all your windows open anyway because it blows COVID away. <laughs> yeah, and then we all freeze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially so, with the with the weather that's forecast over the next few days. Yeah, I think it's going to be a bit cold, isn't it? Mm. So, is that why so many people have been catching it? Because everybody's got the windows open and then allowing the <laughs> to go out into the atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's blowing back in. That's the trouble. Anyway, if there's no questions, then I'm going to call it a day. Um, and again, thanks everybody for, for well, joining. You, Chris. Yeah, thank great, you, se Chris. great session, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy it. Good. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, take care, everybody. Chris. Look yeah, forward Chris. to seeing you all soon. Thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, cheers. Great. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye. Okay, thank guys. you very much. Until later. Bye for now. Bye. There we are. Bye.